podcast listener, and welcome to What Scares Us, a podcast where four friends dissect, discuss, and occasionally psychoanalyze the films that make our skin crawl. My name is Matt. This is Christopher. I'm Amanda. And I'm Allison. Today's film of choice is 1991's Oscar-sweeping Silence of the Lambs, based on Thomas Harris's best-selling novel, where rookie FBI cadet Clary Starling must receive the assistance of an incarcerated and manipulative killer to help catch the deeply disturbed serial killer, Buffalo Bill, who traps and skins his victims. A few fun facts that I dredged up from the internet about this one. It won five awards at the 1992 Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Actor for Anthony Hopkins, Best Actress for Jodie Foster, Best Director for Jonathan Demme, and Best Adapted Screenplay for Ted Talley. For the role of Clary Starling, Michelle Pfeiffer and Meg Ryan were considered, and the other actors who auditioned were Nicole Kidman and Brooke Smith, who ended up in Buffalo Bill's Nightmare Basement playing Catherine Martin. Gene Hackman originally bought the rights to the novel and planned to direct this movie and either played Hannibal or uh, FBI agent Jack Crawford. He withdrew after watching a clip of himself in Mississippi Burning at the Academy Awards, which made him uneasy about taking more violent roles. After Jodie Foster first read Thomas Harris's novel, she tried to buy the rights herself, only to find that Gene Hackman had beaten her to it. The movie was also selected by the Library of Congress for preservation in the National Film Registry in December of 2011 as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. And then the last fun fact that I have is <laughs> Martha Stewart and Anthony Hopkins dated briefly during production. <laughs> Following the film's release, though, Stewart ended the relationship because she couldn't divorce Hopkins from his performance as Hannibal Lecter, which makes a lot of sense Fair. to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so before we kind of go scene by scene and through the movie at large, what, what's everybody's experience with this movie? This is only the second time that I've ever seen it. Wow. But I've heard wow. my brother reference it many, many times. Lots of quotes from this. Uh, Which parts? <laughs> I was going to say, what is it? <laughs> That'll give us a lot of insight in your brother. Nice suit. Yeah. Love your suit. Love oh, yeah. Suit. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even got the quote wrong. Yeah. Love oh, wait, your suit. What he does with his eyes uh -huh. at that point, yeah. too. Oh. I even got the stupid quote wrong. Oh, anyway. whatever. We can edit that. Yeah. We can pretend like you got it right the first time. <laughs> no, <it's a> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is just my second time seeing it. Gotcha. I saw, I was in early high school when it came out, and I remember seeing it and loving it. And it was like a movie, like it was a family movie. We all would watch it. And <laughs> at that point, it was, it was such a part of pop culture. Like it was... If it was, if there were memes back in '91 in the early '90s, it, this would have been meme like crazy. Um, it had such a presence with like you know spoofs and on the late night shows and on Saturday Night Live and just the quotes from it. Like it was just part of like the like our world at that point. And yeah. I I love this movie. I think this movie is great. Um, there are so many wonderful things about it, and I again I wouldn't call it a horror movie, but it is a I guess it is a falls under that category in some respects. But yeah, I I thought it was great. I've seen it many, many times, and I still have a couple lines I quote with friends um, quite often. Yeah, so I was, I'm happy to watch it for here. And after we got the assignment of what we were watching, I actually immediately watched this again. And then I watched um, Hannibal and Red Dragon, and I don't think I had seen either of those. Oh, wow. So I watched all three in a row like a month ago. Okay. And then I watched it again before talking about it. So I've seen the movie so many times. Yeah. But I did pick up a couple of things this time that I had never seen before. And I'll mention those later. But Did you yeah. ever see Manhunter? No, that was the only one I didn't go back. Because Christopher, gotcha. you had mentioned that one. Yeah, I've seen no. that. Yeah, no, I didn't go back to watch that one. But I mean, I was glad to watch the the other two kind of. I've also, I also watched the TV show Hannibal when it was on. I've never read the book, any of the books. Um, Same. And I really, and I'm not into the whole story of like Lecter and Will Graham and all that I don't but it was entertaining I really really liked the TV show when it was on what was it 2013 2015 I think I really enjoyed it I don't remember what happened at the end I just if it came back on I w wouldn't watch it but I remember at the time it was really it was on and it was also it was scary and spooky and that was my first introduction to seeing more of Hannibal Lecter as like a sophisticated, intelligent, you know, well-bred man, like he as, like he's seen in um, like, I guess Hannibal Rising or um, 
Oh, I forgot about Red, Hannibal or in, Rising. Or in Red or Hannibal. That was the one that was in when he was in Italy. Like I didn't really think you can tell by watching Silence of the Lambs, that's kind of how his character is. Yeah. But seeing more of that fanciness about him, I was like, Oh yeah. So for me watching the movie Hannibal kind of put more into that to play for me. I I really remember seeing Hannibal in theaters and um being pretty disappointed by it. It's just, it's, yeah, it's weird. It's like, I can't see Jody or uh, I can't see Julianne Moore, Julianne Moore in that role. Yeah. It's, it, it belongs to Jodie Foster to I me. I just didn't like that movie. Yeah, it's, I, I like the one scene with Ray Liotta towards the end. Oh, towards the end. Um, that is epic. <laughs> also learning later that that was Gary Oldman under all of that. I had no prosthetic idea. Prosthetic makeup. Yeah. yeah. He went yeah. like, uncred- he went uncredited <laughs> in the movie. Yeah. 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 Ugh. Really, Scott? He really. I guess he wanted top billing and he couldn't get it, so then he's like, "Just put me as nothing." <laughs> nice, but yeah. And then there's you mentioned Hannibal Rising is a. I forgot that there was another Hannibal mm-hmm. related movie. I That's think like that when he was, was younger. Yeah, yeah. Which that always goes well when when we get to see what people are like when they were younger. <laughs> love love prequel stuff. <laughs> or, or not? <Yeah. laughs> what about you, Allison? Uh, yeah, I'm a big nerd, so I read the book first. Um, I read it in, I think, middle school, because I was really into, um, like, true crime and serial killers and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but that was, like, 20 years ago, so my memory of the book is, like, not great. And then I'm sure I saw it once or twice in high school, but um, I haven't seen this movie very often and I've seen zero of the other related movies or read any of the other books. So that might be for the best. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, although I do hear that that show is terrific. The show was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like I said, I couldn't tell you what happened. I don't remember half of it. Like I wasn't, I'm not married to the source material. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I almost wish I was. And when we first got this assignment for this podcast, when I watched those three movies, I did put the audiobook on hold and I was like, oh, I'm going to listen to the book. And I'm like, what are you? No, you've got 900 <laughs> other books to read. You, It'll be okay if you don't. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I thought of it as a little project. And sure. since this one has such a, a world built around it, I thought it might be a cool time to read it. And I'm like, you know what? No. Yeah, that's not so. My experience with the other movies is it tells me that the the world of Hannibal Lecter is not nearly as interesting as it is in this movie. <laughs> like especially especially Hannibal. Red Dragon's okay, uh, even though that's I think that's Brett Ratner that made that the guy that is now deeply canceled and also made the I think the Rush Hour movies. Anyway, oh wow, um, yeah, I liked Red Dragon better. Yeah, um, poor Philip Seymour Hoffman. I know that was a good scene. Yeah, yeah. But I thought the storyline of that one was a little more. I was just completely bored when they were in Italy, and I was just like, "Oh my, I can't even." Yeah. Anyways, but we're not here to talk about those movies. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, but it's all part of the same thing, though. Yeah. Well, are we ready to start diving into the movie uh, at large? Okay. So we begin with promising FBI Academy student Clary Starling is pulled from her training at the at the training facility in Quantico, Virginia, by Jack Crawford of the Behavioral Science Unit, who tasks her with presenting a questionnaire to the notorious Dr. Hannibal Lecter, a brilliant forensic psychiatrist and incarcerated cannibalistic serial murderer. After learning the assignment relates to the pursuit of vicious serial killer Buffalo Bill, Starling travels to the Baltimore State Hospital for the Criminally Insane and is led by Dr. Frederick Chilton Mm -hmm. to Hannibal Lecter, (laughs) a sophisticated, cultured man restrained behind thick glass panels and windowless stone walls. Although initially pleasant and courteous, Lecter grows impatient with Starling's attempts at dissecting him and viciously rebuffs her. As Starling departs, another patient flings semen onto her face. (laughs) Enraging Lecter, who calls Starling back and offers a riddle containing information about a former patient, the solved riddle leads to a rent a storage lot where the severed head of one of his former patients is found. Starling returns to Lecter, who links the former patient to Buffalo Bill and offers to help profile Buffalo Bill if he is transferred to a facility far from the venomous careerist Dr. Chilton. So kind of a lot in that paragraph. Let me just say, the movie did not get off to a good start with me because <laughs> immediately it looked really dated. Mm-hmm. It does and look dated. Oh my God, my eyes. Who did the kerning for those opening credits? Oh, right? What yeah. the hell yeah, yeah, yeah. is going That's on? That's always bothered me. And, <laughs> and yes, and also, I don't, this doesn't matter. I know it doesn't matter. 
But if you if you pay attention to how long each name is up there, it's like wildly different from each other. <laughs> um, it's it's always bothered me. That opening sequence is is I mean, really, the best part of it is the music. Mm-hmm. The music yep. in this movie, I think, is is terrific. Um, it's a theme that is routinely stuck in my head, which tells you it's a, a really good piece. But yeah, that whole opening sequence is gross and gray and ugly. And it also reminded me a lot of Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. Sure, the font. The, the font. It's close. It's and close. Even yeah. the setting of the woods and the running. Yeah, it felt very mm-hmm. Twin Peaksy to me. Yeah, I had a hard when I. I wouldn't say I had a hard time, but like early '90s, I totally so many X Files vibes in here. Comparing Clarice to to Scully, like I have way too many notes that I took trying to figure out like when Starling and like Mulder and Scully would have like crossed paths at like the <laughs> FBI in training. Um, but I but I did get the same vibe where it's like dark and gray. One of my first notes was wow, very '90s, and in one of the um, documentary things like the bonus mm-hmm. footage was how they said like 10 years later it really holds up and i was like well a lot more time has passed right. i mean it does hold up as a movie but it still looks like her her blazer is not timeless like that lady wanted to say it was <laughs> like it's just not it wasn't as big as like dana scully's you know like those shoulder pads were very you know minuscule in yeah. comparison right but i did like the opening i like the opening i like how long it was because you're kind of um as she's walking through the trails and doing all of all of the tasks and jumps and whatever physical things that look really difficult, you you're waiting. That anticipation's already starting because it's a long scene. And while she's you know performing these strenuous acts, you're also kind of like doing them along with her. Kind of like waiting. You're climbing the hill. You're waiting to get there, and and then she gets taken away. And I don't know if this is true about the the trails and the exteriors, but I know that they shot this at Quantico, which yeah. is a which is why it looks as ugly. boring and as ugly as it does because <laughs> government facilities like that are going to look like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I thought that was interesting though. That it was the first time I think that any production had ever filmed there. Oh, really? Yeah. And oh. then they, the FBI saw it as a way to try to recruit people, which I don't think worked. No. But <laughs> probably didn't work. Mm-hmm. I like the beginning um – I didn't remember this part at all. So the whole time I was like, what? Like, why is she running? And then once you see her, like, climbing up the thing, I was like, what? why is she on this, like, high ropes course? Like, what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. But on second rewatch, I like it more because um, it's, like, thematically relevant because it kind of relates to her story about taking the lamb and running with it. Like, she starts the movie running, which I think mm-hmm. is cool. You also are immediately shown like there are many men in higher positions who are just sizing her up mm-hmm. eyes are constantly following her and mm-hmm. you know it, that that shot when she first gets in the elevator I surrounded by a bunch of men in red who all are immediately oh looking at her and she's just she looking like up teeny tall. tiny yeah, yeah. <laughs> teeny yeah. tiny the and there's a lot the of world. there's a lot of scenes where they do that on purpose to show her oh, like, yeah. as this you know petite woman surrounded by these you know many many men well, also right. as outsider yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. five foot three. Sorry, I had to look this up. I had to figure <laughs> out, like, because she looks absolutely tiny in that elevator. And she is five foot three. Even in the first office that she goes into to ask where the captain is, as she's leaving, you see the two men just staring at mm-hmm. her. Yeah. Yeah. She's objectified the whole time. And the first quarter of the movie, for me, it was just so cringy. And just I'm just like, oh, my God, just to stop. Every male she interacts with is like, hey, you do eat cheeseburgers? Or, <laughs> yeah. hey. <laughs> It's like, yeah. come on, because a woman is sitting next to you or asking you a question does not mean it's an open invitation. I'm sorry. But, so- oh, not sorry. <laughs> no, you shouldn't be I sorry. It's even. gross. <laughs> and it's extra gross looking at it through a modern lens. One of my first notes is when she's talking to Crawford, and I wrote, this guy has a really odd vibe, like really strange. Like a weird like they they make it like fatherly but it's also mm-hmm. like he's kind of like he wants to get with her he's yeah. like got a little bit of a smirk i remember more of that in the book like i think that they have more of a like well if my wife wasn't dying and i wasn't your boss then like mm-hmm. oh yeah and i feel like for me crawford gave less of that vibe than many of the other males he's still with yeah. yeah yeah like with children it's just like downright creepy like he in but, the movie he doesn't specifically I mean, there's a couple, there's some small things, but it's not as overt as something like 
Chilton because yeah. immediately you're like, oh my God, just close your eyes and just stop. He's the closest thing to an ally that she has other than her friend that's mm -hmm. also a cadet in the entire movie. Everybody else is like mm -hmm. a predator, mm -hmm. essentially. Well, yes. <laughs> but you're right, Allison. He's like, he respects her. And there's other, there's some other males in the movie who do respect her and appreciate Barney. her. Barney. Yeah, Bar I love uh, Barney. Who doesn't love Barney? <laughs> Barney was uh, Burrell in The Wire. You bet. And I love oh. finding yeah. actors from The Wire. Interesting. Yeah. He was also in Hannibal. Yeah, he's in other books. Yeah. He's in a lot of stuff. Oh, also a little Stephen King connection. He was in Maximum Overdrive. Oh, really? <laughs> the one that uh, Stephen King directed. Like, Ooh. Cocaine, the movie. His <laughs> cocaine <laughs> fuel movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was already like, why am I watching this movie? It's so wild. And like, all these people were popping up. I'm like, Emilio West of us. And I'm like, wait a minute. Burrell's in here? Yeah. I was losing my mind. Um, that was, those are my favorite, like, wire actor fries. <laughs> Maximum Overdrive. That, have you ever seen the, there's a trailer for Maximum Overdrive that is introduced by Stephen King. Oh my oh. God. And he's like, he looks absolutely deranged in it where he's just like, everybody's <laughs> tried to make one of my movies oh, Jesus and Christ. no one's gotten it right. Like I'll, I'll show it to you. It's, oh. it is like, he has a beard, which makes him look oh, even no. more scary yeah. to me for some reason. There's that period of time where he looked nuts yeah. um yeah, he was going through he was yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 but he was doing a lot of good work so anyway something that we are are like pretty much pretty much immediately treated to in this movie is the uh every conversation that clary's has with somebody they're looking straight into the camera mm -hmm. and she's looking just beyond it which they did deliberately to mm -hmm. put the viewer in clary's point of view um I have always found those scenes to be really unnerving to have mm -hmm. somebody staring straight into the camera, straight at you. Um, it, for me, it like really increases the intensity of this movie and kind of the mm -hmm. claustrophobic feelings. Yeah, um, especially with Lecter because he never blinks, so he's just staring oh. directly like into your soul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, even too the close-ups from the back and forth between uh, Lecter and Starling, like he has such a large creepy presence, but then to see her reaction. Mm -hmm. Also in full size, like I don't remember if I saw this at the movie theater in the 90s, but can you imagine like that large back and forth, those lo two large faces like for like a longer conversation, like mm -hmm. oh, yeah. it's really powerful or it has a big impact, I think, on the dialogue. I know I saw this in theaters, it's, uh, like not in the first run. I feel like I saw it maybe at the Michigan Theater or something. It was like a late night showing of it and it is really intense like that in theaters and not to jump way the fuck ahead, but the scene at the end in the basement is fucking terrifying in a theater oh, it's bet. like there's so much sound design stuff happening mm -hmm. there that ugh, yeah i was not born when this movie came out <laughs> i yeah i was way too young i would have been four i think when this movie came out so but i definitely i do remember seeing this young though um again it was like post seeing the shining and seven so i was ready for anything mm -hmm. um being scared by it and not understanding what happened with Mix. But <laughs> yeah. anyway. Um, also, something that I noticed in uh, in that early sequence at Quantico, the photos on Crawford's wall uh, of all the victims are pretty nuts. And I don't know if I know that you just said that you watched that documentary thing where they, mm -hmm. where they, where they, those are real photos that they had to go and shoot. And where these people are laying face down in puddles and stuff, and but the they were actors. Yeah, and it was apparently very cold. Um, oh, I bet. And because uh, they didn't want to be disrespectful and use like existing yeah. kind of crime scene photos. Good. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's probably that's a good idea. Um, yeah, those are those are very effective and gross and yeah. I know that Buffalo Bill is based on it was so it's Ed Gein. Ted Bundy, and then there's another guy that I had never heard of who yeah, had the like who a, had the, the whole the puzzle basement. basement. Yeah, um, Gary Heidnick. Yes, right. Really cool dude. <laughs> really cool dude. Good guy. Um, nice house. Um, Great basement. Have you ever seen? Have you? I don't Killer know if you've seen basement. pictures of the basement, but yeah. like the hole is much. It's DIY. like almost. Yeah, it's very <laughs> DIY. <laughs> yes. Wait, I've never heard of this guy. I hadn't either. And his thing was it's so like obviously. There's little bits taken from each of those guys. Right. This guy's thing was, um, so he was trying to create a perfect race of, of people by basically having uh, sex slaves in his basement. Jesus. And he would torture them down there too. And one of the one of the features of it was a hole that he dug that he would put them down into. But it was it was pretty small. It wasn't like a a well like is like yeah. what's in Buffalo Bill's basement. 
but he would shock them in there. And anyway, yeah. Oh my God. Um, not a not a good guy. Uh, <laughs> Other names listed in Wikipedia are Brother Bishop. Brother Bishop? Yeah, Brother Bishop. I'm going to mm. start going by that too. What does that even mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so also featured in that paragraph is is our trip to um to see Lecter himself um <laughs> that long labyrinthian thing down into the basement is extremely cool and i guess it's like three unique locations it's like one of them is is one of a part of it is a set that they built the cell part yeah and um which actually was in a building that is now gone um so you used to be able to go visit it but i think that i think that they bulldoze it in like the 2010s or something at Universal Studios. Ah, <laughs> that's my line. <laughs> <beat you>. Stop. <laughs> um, no cats, no Universal. <laughs> I do not think I can tie it back to Universal this time. Sorry, guys. <laughs> the transition between Quantico and there, like that, which ends up being that line of dialogue, like describe it, where Chilton is describing a, a, a monster, mm-hmm. which is funny because Chilton is kind of a gross monster himself <laughs> yeah. like a smiling suit and tie of a guy Ugh. um yeah he's a he's a creep which also speaks to the impeccable casting of this movie there uh, there there isn't anybody that pops up in this movie who isn't great at what they're doing mm-hmm. yeah i just i love that sequence going down through the through the building to get to the basement um they apparently reused a bunch of it for red dragon Oh, um, yeah, just because they had a lot of establishing shots in there, but the building was gone by the time they made that. So gotcha. I thought that was interesting. I like the red light in the elevator. Mm-hmm. I think in one of the behind the scenes things, they say that it's like to make it seem like you're going to hell. Yeah. Like when it's right on Shelton. Mm-hmm. Feels like it. Yeah. I like the beginning, too, when she's first interacting with Barney before she goes through the cell, that that circular the pan. Cir- yeah. I love that circular pan and all of the background noises and the hums and the whir. It just is really intense. Yeah. And then you're greeted with Barney, who's mm-hmm. just a very yeah. nice, soft face. And, yeah. and I, when he says, you'll do fine, I feel like I'm going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then she, and then she, Walks down the hallway and passes our our murderer's row. Literally, um, first is greeted by the the weird. How does he credit it in this? I think he's credited as uh, t- 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 friendly psychopath. Oh, um, <laughs> aren't they all? <laughs> just your friendly neighborhood. Friendly psychopath, psychopath who just goes hi, <laughs> and uh, apparently he was in Mister Rogers. He was a chef <laughs> on there. Um, then we see Miggs, who is gross and skittering around in his cell like a caged rat or something. And then we're introduced to arguably the heart of this movie, Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter, um, who is already looking creepy at you with his hands down at his side. Yeah, I love that he's standing still because you really expect him to be like flipping out because it's gotten like progressively worse as she walks by. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, you really start to feel like he's in control of the situation, mm-hmm, even though mm-hmm. he's the one who's behind bars. Yeah, he's he's very he's very pulled together. And something in that documentary that was interesting is that those coveralls were tailored specifically to him to make him look like he was more pulled together than the other ones. Mm-hmm. Didn't didn't Hopkins suggest that? Yeah. And same thing later when he's wearing that white suit. Yeah. Or the white outfit. The white the, the white right. outfit when it becomes covered in blood eventually. Right. Because he doesn't like the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's why he chose the all white. Because oh, really? they wanted him in different colors or something. But oh. Anthony Hopkins doesn't like the dentist. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the scene where with Hopkins standing in the cell. All of the scenes of those two interacting are just bonkers amazing. They're yeah. so good. The acting and the dialogue and the tension and like... Lecter is so creepy. And to me, if you want to talk about like what's scary and what's horror, for me this is this is scarier than like monsters and and yep. because this is like a real this is a real even though this is fiction, this is like a real horror. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Everyday horrors are worse than things you, you know. Yeah. And he it's so good and so intense and I can see why people and on the street or people and actors afterwards or actors like during it would be afraid of him because it's so believable and just awful and amazing. <laughs> yeah. 
it's hard for me to think of like a more powerful like antagonist performance in a major motion picture than him. Like it's it. I've seen him in a lot of movies. I can't see him as anything other than this, though. He's so perfect, and I he follow him. Martha he's Stewart. a good follow. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I dated him briefly too. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, so I follow him on Instagram, and I don't know. Oh. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a plug for if if you're listening to this, follow him on Instagram because he's an incredible follow. He plays piano. He does a lot of silly stuff. Mm-hmm. He's a very silly guy. But he still speaks exactly like this. What? I mean, that's just oh, that's no. just how his <laughs> speaking voice kind like of like that normally. He does kind of. It's there. He has the Shakespearean British actor voice. Yeah, it's, but it's there. You can you I can. I guess hear you gotta it. tilt your head down a little bit and talk really slow. Yeah, but he's just yeah, anyway. He's just terrific in this. I just I I think he's perfect, and you almost forget about the massive subplot in this movie of Buffalo Bill every time you see him because mm-hmm. it's it's I mean part of it is by design because he's he's trying to figure out Clarice and I don't know anyway yeah. I just it, he's just a great goddamn actor yeah. yeah I wonder if we'd be talking about this movie today if it was Gene Hackman <laughs> right you know no. right he's like I always wanted to be a lector <laughs> well and then it was Brian Cox and Manhunter who is also great mm-hmm. but couldn't imagine it just wouldn't be the same mm-hmm. um the little hissing noise that he makes after oh. he does a little thing that was apparently an ad lib <laughs> that they didn't plan and and he did it just to be funny but they loved it so they kept it i find it annoying mm-hmm. i love it's, it it's weird i'm not cursed yeah. out by it i just hate it yeah well there's some people who have like, like the, the, the cring- yeah, yeah the auditory and i can see why that would be really good mm-hmm. yeah I think that's why I read this book in the first place is because I was super into Stephen King in middle school. And he's like a perfect example of like the everyday horror where like, are you going to meet a cannibal every day? No. But are you going to meet someone who's like super manipulative or um, trying to get under your skin? Absolutely. I also love that last time I chose a movie where a monkey ripped off someone's face and ate it, and this time you chose a movie where a man does the same. Didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah, you guys have to keep New the requirement. Tradition. Yeah, yeah. Well, to think of another face rip movie. Can't <laughs> every movie. movie. Face off. <laughs> <laughs> that could be considered a horror movie. Or it's a bit of a stretch. Al Motivar. What's what? that? Oh, Al Motivar's movie. Which one was it? Oh, um. Th- the skin With I'm Antonio in. Antonio Banderas. Yeah. Yes, I've I've heard of that, but yeah, I never got around to seeing it. Is it? Yeah. Oh, so good. He's one of my favorites of all time. Good to know. Yeah. I've that's also a, had that. That's check. an aside. <laughs> 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 we have a lot of asides, but that's okay. So yeah, then we have the really gross thing that Migs does, which is still gross. Um, that's like one of the few things I remembered from the book because in middle school I was like. What? It happens in the book? <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Well, two shocking things happen in this opening walk down the hall and the return. And I can't believe that they showed them and included them in the movie. I mean, it's shocking today. Yep. And it must have been even more shocking back then. What was this movie rated? R. PG. But (laughs) (laughs) the funny thing is, I mean, you so rarely hear that word. The C word? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Even (laughs) today, you you rarely hear that. Mm -hmm. It's true. And then to see the other scene of him flinging himself is uh, shocking. I wonder if there was a debate with the the ratings people. The MPA. I I don't know. I didn't find anything about that in my in like any research. But yeah, it's it's especially interesting because it's it was such a beloved movie and swept the. I can't even imagine what the stuffy people at the academy <laughs> thought when they saw that. Right. Yeah. I guess they say it twice. Mm-hmm. But also, I she like, says it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That's she repeats right. it back. It's, I mean, it's said twice. Yeah, right, the right, word right. Is yeah, she right. doesn't flinch though when she says yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, too, this another thing I think that that sets up is at the when Lecter does not like the fact that he insulted Starling, and so when he asks her that question, and then later on you see like what happened to Migs because of that. 
you can already sense that that connection or that care yeah. is awkward and weird and whatever as it is, Mm -hmm. you get that sense that he still, he was not going to harm her, you know? And that was just one, that was the first time he met her when he, you know, he knew that he, that was not, you don't do that. You can't do that. Well, also it shows his power and this Mm -hmm. movie is all about power dynamics and a struggle for power. So it's also interesting to see like, oh, Migs did this thing and then somehow Lecter got him to die. (laughs) From he whispered through inside the wall. The cell. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I want to know what he said. Yeah. yeah. I also, like, you can't swallow your own tongue. So, like, what do you do there? I've always, th- I've thought about that. There's Cut a couple of things in this movie. Yeah. yeah. Right. I don't know. I also, I'll go with it, though. Probably, I'll allow it. You could probably pull it <laughs> off or, like, stab your fingernail. I could, what? you could literally, if you have sharp fingernails, you could like saw off your tongue yeah, and like it, it's still connected, but then like shove it into the back of your throat. You can bite it too. Yeah. Was he just saying, hey, swallow your tongue. Swallow your own tongue. <laughs> I bet you can't swallow your own tongue. Yeah. I bet you a million I bet dollars. you can't do that, you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't so watch so me. Good fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? They missed opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I know there's there are apparently a lot of deleted scenes for this. I did not get to watching them though. Uh, I I also realized when I set out to watch this movie, I forgot that like mid pandemic haze, I bought the Criterion Collection uh, version of this. So I found it in a drawer and went, oh. Mm-hmm. And I meant to s- sit down and actually like dive into. There are a ton of extra features in that, nice. and I wanted to see. I did watch a bunch of the documentaries. Yeah. One of them, one of the documentaries. I forget what it's called, but it's actually the full movie with little pop outs of like, the actors talking during hmm. it. Yeah. Not I like a, that. it's not billed as a commentary or anything. It's just like yeah. they would talk a little bit about it. And so I honestly wish that I would have watched that most recently because then I could have watched the movie and got that commentary. Sure. I couldn't sit and watch another two hour. Like I'm, so I watched some of the shorter <laughs> ones. Yeah. The bloopers were pretty fun. There's only a handful of those. <laughs> and then for the deleted scenes, there were maybe eight. They're all kind of okay. short. Yeah. But for me, it did give me a little bit more. It gave me some more information. Nice. It gave me some more information um, for the movie and understanding some of the characters with the long, some of the longer scenes. Nice. I watched the commentary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was funny because like a little tiny square of the actor like more recently would pop up sometimes, but also like this uh, like notebook piece of paper would like slide on the left mm-hmm, side of the yeah. screen with like really random facts every once in a while <laughs> like right at the beginning they're like so and so many female like people apply to be in the fbi and like go to quantico it's like okay mm-hmm. but like <laughs> i don't care <laughs> i bet that it's was produced small. at like the height of vh1's pop-up video and oh. shit like that i'm I, because that was a thing for a while so you're like supposed that. to be watching the movie listening to the talking head and reading this nova piece paper at the same time i bet the director <laughs> wants exactly that that's how I work best. <laughs> um. I, I was confused because I could never figure out what makes Hannibal change his mind. Like he says that Migs is like discourteous, but Hannibal Lecter was rude as hell to her 10 seconds ago. So like what changed? Like, you Power. know what I mean? He's like, <laughs> your cheap shoes and your blah, blah, blah. Like, go fuck off. And then she leaves and then like that happens. And then he's like... Come back, come back. Like, what was the change of... Yeah. Like, why did he change his mind? He just doesn't like the C word. Power. Matt, you mentioned yeah. power. It's got real Dumbledore energy to it. What does that mean? <laughs> did, Harry, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? It's like, Clarice, come back, come back. And then she immediately gets that close to the glass. And that was one right. thing they told her, don't go near the glass. Don't go. And then yeah. and in the following visits she's always sitting like right in front of the glass right yeah yeah i'm gonna start dismissing people like that go now (laughs) go now (laughs) run run (laughs) yeah i feel like there should be like a sense of urgency in like daily tasks it's like go for the butter now (laughs) get the butter (laughs) the toast is cooling oh we can start today Oh, um, it was also in this scene that the little like paper popped up and gave Hannibal Lecter's full backstory with like World War II stuff. Didn't need to know that this early in the movie. Right. Yeah. And we also don't get any of that Not in here. this movie. No. That's like, Hannibal Rising stuff. Doesn't really matter. No. You know, like, I don't know. World building in movies is, it can be cool, but I don't think it needs to happen here. Yeah. But is it real? 
I mean, is it real when they put it in so much after the fact? Like, I I just watched the movie without, mm-hmm. you know, rewatching any of the sequels or prequels or anything, and it's like, he's he's not a World War II vet in this movie, Mm-mm. you know? No, he um he's a kid in World War II, okay. and his parents are killed, and then his sister is killed and possibly eaten by Nazis, and that's why he's but it's a like cannibal. none, of, you know, that's goofy. That is they goofy. just add that all in. Yeah. Kind of, it's like some intern just wrote that up. I think it's <laughs> one of the later books or something. Right. It's yeah. Yeah. It's Hannibal Rising. It's like how he came to be. Right. Oof. No. But also, I won't allow it. <laughs> <laughs> but like, with, with just and again, I haven't read the books, but with just watching the movie Silence of the Lambs, you don't need. You know, something bad happened to him. Something happened to make him the way he is. Um, even after he becomes like a, a fully fledged psychiatrist, you're supposed to be helping other people. Mm. He can use that to his advantage, but you know he came from somewhere. But that's not the point of this movie. This that's yeah. and mm-hmm. you don't need to know. Like I never, I never thought about him and where I was. I was more thinking about Buffalo Bill because that that was the focus. And they were trying to figure out who he was, where he came from, and that was when Lecter and Starling and the rest of the some of the FBI folks were trying to piece it together. And I. I didn't think about. I was too busy being like freaked out by this, like, <laughs> yeah, his voice and his face and like the relationship with him and Starling and. But no, it just it's not necessary. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and blame his parents though, because they named him Hannibal. Yeah, like come on, Hannibal, you have to Hannibal. become a cannibal at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know what you can rhyme with that. Well, wasn't he the great general? That animal. Marched? Sorry. The, <laughs> animal, the, the animal, the animal. <laughs> That's like the college version. That's right. Yeah. He's a party animal. <laughs> so uh, from here, we we now go to the yourself storage unit um, in a scene that tells me that I am not cut out for FBI work. <laughs> yeah. um, the idea of going into that storage unit is fucking terrifying. Um Pretty slick using the uh, the jack from your car though to get that the door part of the way up. Starling is resourceful. Uh, gotta know uh, how did she deal with the cut? Because I all I could think is that's gonna get infected. Yeah. Um, but then light, later, Lecter says, "Didn't he say the bleeding stopped?" Yes, right. Which <laughs> I don't know how he noticed that, but he's a shark; he can smell it. That's fair. Yeah. He, well, he did smell up to the go- anyway. Her Evian. Uh, skin, skin cream. cream, yeah, which I don't think is even a thing, but Avion skin cream, yeah, I don't know. It's water. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. so I watched it with subtitles and it was it, it was spelled different. E. It oh, starts really? with an E and it's, it's and there's Avion. a Y in it, yeah. Mm. Avion skin cream, <laughs> and then what's the thing that she, that, but not today, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she usually wears something or other. Oh, it's the perfume, yeah, yeah, but not today. Anyway, his effect and like those it's weird so, things they does yeah. the, the best. What my favorite one of the thing is where he puts on a little accent and says like, "Oh, Agent Starling, do you think you can dissect me with this blunt little tool?" Uh-huh. <laughs> I love when she says "charm skewel" earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently that the accent thing he did that. Um, that was another ad lib that like actually rattled her and. and they say that you can mm-hmm. see it on her face, um, like making fun of her accent. Yeah, I I love that line it's and good. him saying it with her accent. It's just like it was like it's like watching a duel. Mm, it was yes. like watching those two like a duel. Mm-hmm. Anyways, that took us back. Now we're still we're in the the storage unit. Yes, we're in the storage unit. Uh, there's a lot of weird shit in there. I I will say, when I was watching the scene right before she got into the storage unit, it looked so TV stagey to me. I don't know mm-hmm. if anyone else picked up on that. Her car looks like it's right on a stage, and it just it looked so TV ish. There's a few things like that, that and I I don't I, you know I don't I can't put my finger on what exactly I would do to fix it, but it just it took me out of the scene. Are, are you talking about the like her flashback when she's walking out to her car? She's walking out to her car. And she's to remembering get the her jack. dad. Oh, that's that scene. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. She's just, it, and it's like the way her car is perfectly centered on the stage yeah. or the in the scene. It just looks so TV-ish. And I was just surprised because I didn't remember feeling like that. I think it's partly just the dating. Yeah. You know. I didn't think about that. Go oh. back and watch it. All of you. I do. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, go now. We're going to go. <laughs> 
I, I, all I could think was the, the whimsical yourself storage sign, and I want to know where that is now. Right. Like somebody inevitably has yes. that in their rumpus room at their house <laughs> in Santa Monica, and, and, uh, and I want it. I also love the absolutely useless German man who accompanies her. <laughs> <laughs> one of the That's um, my rap name, absolutely <laughs> German man. One of the deleted scenes is that man saying something to Starling when she's underneath the half open garage door. He says, May I suggest tucking your pants into your socks to prevent rodent intrusion? <laughs> And then she goes, she's, she's lying on the floor and she says something like, okay, good hint. And she tucks like half of her pant leg into one of her socks and then goes under the door. Aw. So I not absolutely a, useless. <laughs> to prevent rodent intrusion. I thought that was really sweet of him. That, huh. Again, he's a, a man trying to protect this like tiny woman underneath the half open door that will cut her in half. So his his hero to villain track would, you know, happened because yeah. of a deleted scene. <laughs> Don't let a, a mouse enter your pant leg. Yeah. yeah. He could have been the hero of this movie. So then Clarice finds the car with the massive American flag draped across it. Um, and then in there is a weird little setup and then surprise, a head in a jar, Mm -hmm. uh, a really, really awesome looking head in a jar, by the way. I couldn't tell if it looked super realistic or extremely fake. Yeah. It's it. I, I remember when I was a kid that that scared me a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wondered then, and I still, <laughs> I don't know, something about the eyelid, like yeah. seeing the like white of the eye, it's just gross. And I, I paused it and really stared at it until my <laughs> wife asked, can we, can you, are you ready to keep, ready to keep watching this? I really I looked at it. It, 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 it looks good. Um, where's the rest of his body though? Hmm. I don't know. I also vaguely remembered this happening later in the book. Mm. Like, I, I thought maybe she went to a couple different storage places in the book. Um, this is also when I noticed that the pacing of this movie is incredible. We are just rocketing through all yep. of the different um, set pieces and plot points. It moves. The movie's just under two hours. Yeah. It's a good, for it's a two perfect. hour movie, yeah. Oh, also, I don't remember the specifics, but um, the head is different in the book. In the book here it's benjamin someone mm-hmm. and it's like james gum's lover but in the book it's something like they broke up and then benjamin was with klaus and it's klaus's head benjamin raspel yeah something like yeah, that Rasp- it's yeah. like slightly more convoluted but i don't think it's necessary it, here yeah, yeah again it doesn't matter it doesn't add much it's just like oh shit a head in a jar mm-hmm. that like sets it off you're like okay mm-hmm. yeah well, that's yuck. <laughs> I also love that Hannibal Lecter is like, yeah, well, it's fine because he was like not doing his appointments right anyway. It's like, whoa, this is not a good psychiatrist. <laughs> no, not so good. <laughs> this has a lost cause. <laughs> Fuck you. All right. Now, so hours and miles away, Buffalo Bill abducts Catherine Martin, the daughter of United States Senator Ruth Martin. Starling is pulled from Quantico and accompanies Crawford to West Virginia, where the body of Bill's most recently discovered victim resides. In the plane taking them to town, Crawford asks Starling what she sees in the file on Buffalo Bill. She says that Bill is a male, definitely white, and that he's getting better at his work since he's developed a taste for it. At the coroner's office, Starling helps perform the autopsy and extracts the chrysalis of a death's head hawk moth from the victim's throat. When the victim is turned over for, for further examination, they find that two large diamond-shaped strips of flesh have been flayed from her body. Having already spoken to Lecter about how Bill flays his victims, this detail is recorded by Starling. So, yeah, this the sequence of Catherine driving her car and listening to Tom Petty um, <laughs> has kind of ruined that song for me. I Aww. love that song. That's one of my favorite songs. But when I hear it, I imagine her beating her steering wheel, driving... Uh, and being hounded by very spooky Buffalo Bill, who were first introduced to here. It's a stalking song to you, Matt? It is a stalking song. I love that song. I don't think of this movie. Also, I like that scene because, like, as a 
I would put that song really loud on my car, but the windows down. Like if I've been out and I'm driving home, I love having music laid. In, just it's really like the loud. ultimate summer night song. Yeah, exactly. It really and so is. She, and I love that she was having that moment. She's just a normal girl having that normal moment driving in her car. Yeah. Well, just know that somebody with night vision goggles is watching you when you're listening <laughs> to that song. I don't want to think about that every time like... I drive home from somewhere. Well, if I have to, everybody has to. <laughs> Says a man. <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> We also get the, a nice little exchange with her cat, who is hanging out by the open window. Hell yeah. What was um, his name? I wrote it down. Mr. Cheepers? Oh, yeah. Little, that's little right. Cheepers. Little Cheepers? Yeah. I didn't right. pick up the name. Allison took a great note for us. That's good. I updated our cat part of our spreadsheet. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> we really needed that. <laughs> I actually referred to that. <laughs> Why did you? I wasn't being sarcastic. I'm always looking for cats in these movies, and I don't know how we started this, but it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but our first vision of seeing of him in that van and his voice, his voice is so creepy. Oh. Yeah, or he's got the broken arm and you, you as a person who Would knows you? like Ted Bundy stuff, I'm like, oh, it's a, oh, Bundy, yeah. it's a Bundy move. The, the, the Bundy move. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm like, don't do it, don't do it. So obvious, you dumbass, don't get in the truck. Don't get in it, yeah. <laughs> Make his weird ass get in there. So it's interesting that we've got American Girl playing mm-hmm. and we had that huge American flag that was draped over that car in the storage shed and we've got this kind of buffalo bill which is this kind of quintessential american figure Mm -hmm. you know it's there are a lot of flags that pop up later there are a lot of flags Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's kind of interesting to just think about that with you know i mean serial murderers seem to be a kind of american thing i know there have been serial murders from other countries but but we really take the cake on that one. <laughs> Jesus. I do think that serial killers have sort of been replaced by mass shooters now. Oh. It's like same vibe, but um, better weapons. Yeah. Also just wanted to say when Crawford is kind of grilling Starling from what she's learned from the file, I almost get the sense that Crawford is not testing her, but Starling is really informing him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he doesn't know. And, but he's still playing it off like he's in charge and knows everything. And she's the one who's doing all the work and informing him mm-hmm. of everything. Yeah. Right. Well, immediately, I got that vibe from Crawford because even though he's still seeming like polite and not crossing those lines, he is still sending this little Starling bird <laughs> down this hole with these horrible men who've done horrible things. To, and she's going to meet Hannibal Lecter, like the Hannibal Lecter. You throw a, a student in there yeah. as like your your last resort to try to save the day. And she does it. And it's one of the best things about the movie. But it's still, it's so like, you're just tossing her in there. Mm-hmm. Well, you know? it's got to be her because it's got to be someone who's pure of heart. It's, you know what? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy that it's still a little bit subtle. It's like we know Crawford's not just purely a nice boss, mm-hmm. but he's not like Chilton either. Right. You know, we're still supposed to respect him on some level or think he's an okay, sort of cool guy. But I liked that it's still a little bit subtle. Yeah. In the like commentary thing, they talk a lot about how Crawford is sort of a foil to Lecter, where like um, oh. they're both manipulating Clarice to yeah. get the thing, the outcome that they want. But at least Lecter is honest with her about it. Right. Um, so it's almost like a better relationship between Lecter and Clarice because at least he's upfront about what he's doing and what he wants, whereas Crawford is more sort of um, veiled. Yeah, they got yeah. they got to climb that ladder. Yeah, Crawford. All these is guys got to climb that ladder. Always lying to Starling. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Gets her in trouble later. Almost. Definitely, because in the book, she's taken off the case, and that's why she's not a part of um, any of that. Like, that's why she's in Ohio or whatever while everyone else is in Chicago is because oh, she's right. <laughs> going rogue. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do like that scene a lot, the the autopsy scene. Oh, there's yeah. a lot of suspense. There's a lot of, like, stillness. It's tough to watch. It is, and, like, I did not sew at the time when I saw this movie in high school, even though I've been around a lot of sewists. So when they flip the body over... As a person who knows that now, I'm like, oh, if there were more women in this room, maybe they or somebody else, people would have known. And I would have been, oh, that's a pattern piece. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they would have been tracking down seamstresses earlier. 
there are so many dudes in that scene and so they all yeah, are just staring scene. at her like with like looking at what the fuck are you doing here but it's every scene they're in a circle yep. and they look at her yeah and then but she's so boss about it she's so boss and so confident it rolls right off her and she every fi- time she you know she always finds the thing and every scene it's always her finding the doing you know yeah saving the day i kind of love the way that when she's excusing them like okay we're gonna take this over she's like, go on now like she's yeah. talking to a bunch of cats <laughs> <laughs> Or the way that I talk to Go raccoons now. if I see them. Go on now. Get out of here. I'll get. That's... Um, yeah, the autopsy scene is is great and gross, and I can't imagine what it smelled like in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what it, if if it were real? Yeah. Um, one of the guys that you see with kind of like the the classic crew cut is the is the producer uh, of oh, this. Um, interesting. I think he actually gets like a line of Jesus Christ or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he's got a line. Uh, yeah, he didn't know why he, Jonathan Demi wanted to give him a speaking role. <laughs> Kenneth Utt is his name. Yeah, he's got and, great uh, hair. He's a production designer and like he really greased the wheels to make this movie happen. And so he he gets like one like, oh. <laughs> <on camera. laughs> well, you know, when they're rubbing the the salve or whatever under their nose it's mm-hmm. adding so much tension i think to yeah. that scene and you are getting set up as the viewer to think oh god this is really going to be terrible yeah mm-hmm. yeah mean, you've never seen that in, in any other movie you know it's yeah a, it's also interesting because it's sort of implying like another sensory aspect like in what movie do you know what it smells like yep in a certain scene you know what i mean yeah like when they're putting that under the nose i feel like you can smell like you briefly can smell something yeah you know Mm -hmm. it's and you're imagining the worst thing yep there's also a line i really like here some random fucking man at the autopsy says when a body comes out of the water a lot of the time there's like leafs and things in the mouth oh yeah he stops and he even says like <laughs> yeah and he it's says the organist without a v yes leaves yeah. there's leaves in there there's like <laughs> leaves and stuff in there <laughs> yeah. but how would they have also not Look. Well, it's it, the other thing is that picture that they take, like when we see the brief glimpse of it, I don't know how the fuck she can tell there's something in there. But no. it, there's like a, a discoloration on the throat, I thought. Hmm. There's like darker lines. Hard to tell, yeah. It's, but, but either way, then. She looks at the neck and then she says she's got something in her something throat. Something in there. Something in her throat. And then they, the, the, ugh, the, it makes my skin crawl when they pull it out and the, the, like her breath escapes, like the, oh, that happens. Oh, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, they added they added that. John and the Demi specifically wanted that. Well, it made me feel bad. I, <laughs> I also like how before they go to the morgue to do this, um, one of the cops is like, found a girl, a Buffalo Bill type situation. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh. Bunch of bumblers, man. Just bumbling around. When there's a pack of these males standing around Scully, I don't know. <laughs> I said Scully. Oh my goodness! See, I'm uh-huh. so I I spend so much time in this movie thinking about like Starling and Scully and their effect on women in the FBI and women in science. It just because it had an impact. It had an impact. Mm-hmm. I think Scully is based yeah. on Clarice. Plus the time frame. I just still want to picture them at like Quantico to get, even though they wouldn't have quite. But still, at some point. She dated Fox Mulder. I just know it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think we're entering into fan fiction. Yeah, that's right. Here. It probably exists. If you can think of it, there's a fan fiction for it, and it's weirder than you think. Yeah. <laughs> this, this scene also, when she found the thing in the throat, it remi- I, I was hearing a line from The Wire in my in my mind where one of the male cops in The Wire says to the female cop, Good pull, Greggs. Because <laughs> Shakima Gregg, she did some. She was always saving the day in that show, you too. Bet. I mean, they were all, they were actually. Good cops. I could. I'll stop talking about the wire now. But good pull, Gregs. I could picture them saying that to Starling. Like, I'm like, oh, that's the same. Like, you know, the opposite of an attaboy. It's like yep. a girl. Yep. <laughs> so then, from here, she takes the cocoon to uh, the two weird nerds that are playing. <laughs> was it checkers or chess with the bugs? I think it was checkers, wasn't it? I don't know. I don't remember. But um, and even even the the geeks that she that she sees are kind of being leery and gross. And the one guy said, has a line about, who are going off for beer and cheeseburgers? God. Well, 
Yeah. In the book, they end up together at the end. What? Ew. Yeah, they're really? vacationing together. Huh. Really? Pilcher and Clarice. His name, yeah. is, his name is Pilcher? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, those two creeped me out <laughs> almost more than Chilton. <laughs> really? Yeah, Aww. I thought they were nasty. Really? I thought they were just little baby They're just nerds. bug guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Baby nerds can like ladies, too. <laughs> They like they're all against me. <laughs> these were the, well, because the, these guys felt like the like. I think I have a note. Like these are the least like. These are the most harmless guys in the movie. Oh, though I think this is the point where I wrote, "All the men are so creepy." <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. they are. They even, are. But what stood out for me is the same thing you're both saying because it stood out. I'm like, oh, there's more guys, even though these ones seem to, are going to be innocent and nice. They're still hitting on her. It's like yeah, the, it's yeah. more like more of the same. Right. I can't remember if the uh, if the guy that's actually in, inspecting the jar really hits on her though. I can't remember. No, just the one guy. Will just the one guy, and, and his is burgers. really it's real sweaty, but yeah. it's yeah. but it's it it makes me laugh in that way. Well, and doesn't the one guy say you don't even have a PhD? Or yes, something? they almost say him. He doesn't have a PhD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bad. That's a rough burn. <laughs> I can just see those two, but those two are just like hanging around the basement doing their work, like with their, their playing bugs with their bugs and <laughs> being scientists. And like, that's a, that's, you don't got PhD. Like that's a big slam to them. I don't know. I, I thought it was endearing. I like when they were talking about, then they were dropping the science about like the moth and scaling it back. Yeah. Show us the basement. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that is where we go next, which is the terrifying, the scariest thing in this movie to me is that basement. Mm-hmm. Um, just because, especially later when we actually see what the house looks like, there's a house not far from me. I'm not going to dox myself, but there's a <laughs> house not far from me that really reminds me of this place. It's like in a state of like slight moldy disrepair, and it looks like it might have a nightmarish compound under oh, it. No. It's all I can think when I walk past it every time. <laughs> and the way that we slowly move through and see what the place is like and all the weird shit on the walls and the moths flying around like ugh. yeah it, it's this it's one of the scariest things that i could imagine and houses like this exist in towns all over the place mm-hmm. um it's the energizer bunny of basements yes it keeps yes going and going it really and going. does <laughs> There are a lot of things that are scary that happened before this but this is what firmly makes this a horror movie to me mm-hmm. um Cause it's just, it, your mind can't, like, I can't stop thinking about what else could be down there. Mm-hmm. You know? Or I don't want to say the name of this movie in case somebody ha- hasn't seen it yet, but there's that one newer horror movie. Yeah. I, I thought the oh, same yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. It came yeah. out last year. Yeah. yeah. That ins- I, yeah. We'll say y'all, whatever movie we're talking about, you should go and see it. We'll tell you we later. We can cut this out. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Right. yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But You're that's so a, nice. That's a good spoiler. Oh yeah. man, yeah. 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 Oh right, that is a total spoiler, of mm-hmm. course. Yeah, it's right. the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, God, I love that movie. <laughs> this movie, so many movies borrow from this, mm-hmm. it, just in terms of pacing, in terms of set pieces. Like it, this this movie kind of ended up being hugely influential to a lot of other stuff, and that's part of why I love it so much. Um, I love that our view of the basement is so quick too. We're moving from room to room to hallway to room. Mm-hmm. And um, even though I've seen it twice, my brain is like working overtime trying to figure out like, okay, well, if I'm in here, how do I escape? Like what's the route mm-hmm. out? And how does this all connect? And yeah. you never get a good sense of it, mm-hmm. no, never. which is I'm sure deliberate. Cause it's filmed and laid out in sort of a labyrinth where you just like, in and out because even when i was going to say scully again oh my goodness even <laughs> when starling is wandering through at the end you still don't know what rooms connect your brain wants to connect those two because you're already it's tense you yeah. what's my escape if i'm here what is my escape yeah but yeah that it's introduction, such a labyrinth it is it's a labyrinth yeah um but that introduction to the basement and him and everything it's mm. i want precious I want to know what shit Miss Lippman was up to because he didn't build that basement himself. Right. Why is there a well in like 45 rooms and what shit was she doing? Unless it was like a cistern or something. Or what about the basement what Maybe. What was in the Beyond, the movie we watched prior in a previous episode? <laughs> that basement had, I can picture a well being in that basement. That basement was very moist. Sure. And that movie was just as realistic as this one. <laughs> that one had zombies. This one doesn't. Th- that one had a had a portal to hell. 
This one... As an elevator. Um, as an elevator. The portal yeah. of the hell is at the FBI. <laughs> it's like the that's the right. That's right. <laughs> oh, Buffalo Bill's dog. So cute. Precious. Yeah. Great dog actor, Darla. Oh, yeah. That's the dog's name. <laughs> One of my notes is just like, oh, my God, is that a Bichon? It's a perfect little dog. <laughs> and it's, that but, dog's first movie was Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Yep. I went, yeah, I was very mm-hmm. excited to learn his name was Darla. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, it was in four movies and some TV shows. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it lived to be like 17 or something. Yeah. I've loved every Darla I've ever met. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Which is one. <laughs> At Quantico, as news of Catherine Martin's abduction sweeps the country, Crawford authorizes Starling to offer Hannibal Lecter a fake deal promising a prison transfer if he provides information that helps profile Buffalo Bill and rescue Catherine Martin. Instead, Lecter begins a game of quid pro quo with Starling. Classic. Offering comprehensive clues and insights about Buffalo Bill in exchange for events from Starling's traumatic childhood. Unaware to both Starling and Lecter, Chilton tapes the conversations and after revealing Starling's deal as a sham, offers to transfer Lecter in exchange for a deal of his own making, one that will make Chilton out as a hero for identifying and tracking down Buffalo Bill. Boo. Right. Lecter agrees and following a flight to Tennessee, reveals Buffalo Bill's real name, physical description, and pass address to Senator Martin and her entourage of FBI agents and Justice Department officials. He also insults Martin openly, Mm -hmm. asking about her breastfeeding of her daughter. Martin orders Lecter back to Baltimore when he spills Buffalo Bill's identity information. Yeah, so a lot happens in that little little blurb there. One thing I love is the filming of this where we see both Lecter and Starling's face on screen at the same time. That shot is so cool. You bet. You can see her reflection in the glass. Oh, yeah. 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 He like leans forward and uh, there's also like a couple of exchanges with them because there's that one where he's in total darkness where he offers her the towel and you're kind of scanning her. Like the camera's moving really slowly across the glass and you're trying to figure out where the hell he is. Mm -hmm. And then you just see him kind of lounging in there and they've taken all of his pictures because he made Migs go away. Drawings rather. His punishment. His memories. Yeah, that's right. Anthrax Island. Mm -hmm. I have a question though. Did Clarice know the deal wasn't real? I feel I like don't, she. I feel like she thought it was real. I, right. I when thought she it was, was offering too, it to him. Yeah, because he would have picked up that she was lying. Mm-hmm. But then later there was just like he said something about like, oh, that was a nice little detail. Was that yours? And she says yes. So yeah. she must have known something. She sells it though. She sold me on it. I believe that I was going to that island. She was very very enthusiastic about it. So yeah, seeing okay, my. Number one question about this movie that has haunted me forever is how the fuck does he get the pen? Yeah. In the book, it's a piece of a pen. It's like the tube right. inside and something else. Mm-hmm. He has that later but in the movie. but Because we see him looking at it pen. on the bed. Mm-hmm. And it's like, are we just to believe that Chilton forgot it in there somehow? But then he wouldn't have taken him off of the, the dolly that he was strapped to. But later on, Chilton goes to reach his pen. He's like, where did pen go? So right. we know, we know those two scenes of, we know that he has the pen. Yeah. Because there's some delay in between each of those three scenes. There is. So it's like. But I still don't see how we got the pen. I don't know how we got it. I just, uh, if, if it's on Chilton's body, it makes it easier than if it's on a table somewhere else. Because he reaches into his pocket later to see. Mm-hmm. But it was like on his bed. Yeah, I was on his bed because you see him really staring at it. And it's just like, okay, well, how did you get that into your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> he's got a really long tongue. Yeah. <laughs> but also, I, he's so crafty. I I didn't even think twice. Of course, he's going to figure out a way to get the pen. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. He's right. He's so brilliant yeah. and conniving. Yeah, I both really liked the fact that they didn't show it and also thought it was a cop out. Because if they had concocted some elaborate James Bondian way that he got the pen into his hand <laughs> yeah. or into his mouth, it might have been worse. Yeah. And oh, so, it definitely would have been yeah, worse. Yeah. I kind of like that there's such an implication because he's looking at that pen. Yeah. He's looking at that pen. It's right over there. He's got to get that pen. Yeah. And then Chilton doesn't have the pen. So it's kind of like. Well, he figured out some way. He got it somehow. Right. We just know he's crafty. Right. It just builds more mm-hmm. into like, oh, he's he's extremely capable. Right. Mm-hmm. Even when he has a like a wire meshed thing on his face. <laughs> <laughs> and then another and then a different one, a hockey mask later. Yeah. What he has a little wardrobe change. 
And it just, it adds to his whole persona and character and for the people around him and even as a, a movie watcher to fear him and understand he is capable of anything. And even like the big scene later after he gets moved, he's, and even like how he like escapes and like in some of the other movies and adventures, adventures he's, he goes on, it's he, he stops at nothing and he gets, he does it all so successfully. Like he wins every time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just liked how the pen is just a further little, of course, yeah. put that in his little, you know, tool belt. He's really good at that too. He's a winner. He's a winner. He He's wins. a winner. He wins. He wins at cannibalism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't remember in sequence when it happens, but where like the lotion in the basket scene happens at some point in the midst of this, which mm -hmm. is a, um, which is tough. It's also one of the most quoted things from yeah. this. Yeah. Um, in often in like a in like comedic stuff, and mm -hmm. watching the scene itself, there's nothing funny about no. it. Like her saying like she she does such a good job of sobbing and saying that she wants her mommy yeah. which makes it extra like oh yeah and then and put the lotion on the fucking basket like, <laughs> i also like how he call he says it yeah mm -hmm. yes it places the lotion right well there's that scene earlier where the senator goes on tv and is like she <laughs> she she Catherine, Catherine, right. Catherine. that actually really bugged me because one of the things i learned in middle school was um, about the Oakland County child killings oh, yeah. in the 70s. One county over, four confirmed, possibly more kids were like murdered by someone. They never found out who, but um, the last kid who was abducted, his parents went on TV and, or I think his dad went on TV. His mom might have written a letter. But anyway, at some point she said, you know, uh, I forget his name. But she's like, oh, you know, he's so and so many years old. Like he likes this. He likes KFC. Well, when they found his body, it had KFC in it. Mm -hmm. So like whoever mm -hmm. did it was watching and like knew that. Mm -hmm. So like I don't know that that really helps in like humanizing the victim. Like I think right. once you've kidnapped a kid, you're pretty, you already blew it. You're in it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're not going to back out now. Yeah. Just because you're like, oh, well, now I know his name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I did like though that she was she was both sad but also yelling mm -hmm. back at Buffalo Bill, yeah. just furious. Well, too in that moment, is that when we see the lights and you can see the red the red bloody the claw fingernails, marks? and then we, is, we tie that back to the morgue Ooh, yeah. scene yep. of knowing that that's like oh she right. got something on her nails. Mm -hmm. Like then we're like oh she's noticing calling and trying to claw mm -hmm. her way out. Yeah, and then she starts screaming, and then Bill, like, mocks her. Mocks her, which is fucked up. Yeah. yeah. Ugh. It's weird, though, because he's, like, upset first. Yeah. And yeah. then he mocks her. Then I, it's funny. Oh, right. Then he's like, yeah. I didn't pick up that he was mocking her. I thought he was just uh, kind of reacting to the general noise of the scene. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say, oh, I'll go back and rewatch that scene, but <laughs> no. I don't need to. Just, just that one. <laughs> I'll just take your word for it. Go ahead and rewatch that scene right. that's and a the mid scene. scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that's a good scene, and I I quote the the lotion all oh, all yeah. the well, time. Kind of partly, this movie is a little bit wrecked because this movie is so quoted. <laughs> yes. And after I saw this movie the first time a long, long time ago, then I saw the Lego musical. What? Based on this movie. What? So there's a, yeah. Why? <laughs> Why is I Someone showed it to me. <laughs> and so it's all these Lego figures singing that scene. <laughs> and so. Sounds awesome. It kind of is awesome, but it also takes a lot of the oomph out of the movie. Yeah. yeah. You know, which is kind of a shame. Well, you should have watched it when it came out, Christopher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, th these scenes, even though like, uh, like I can picture sequences in like the Cable Guy where they make fun of it, and like, yep, and I, Saturday Night Live had things obviously with if, making fun of it. It's just it's, but it doesn't rob any of these scenes of the power for me. Yeah, um, and apparently, like the actor that played Buffalo Bill and um, and the actress playing the young woman in the well, they were like really good friends on set. <laughs> Which I guess to, to like people working on the movie, they thought it was extremely fucking weird because yeah. of the. But the scenes that they were doing were so intense that they they 
there was something with Ted Levine, I think is his name. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're saying like it, we had to break the tension because like it's messed up. Like we were doing the most messed up stuff you could possibly think of. Yeah. I think Jodie Foster called the girl that plays Catherine um, Patty Hearst because it was like a, I forget what that's called. Stockholm Syndrome. Yes, yep. Stockholm Syndrome. Yep. Yeah. I also want to mention um, Hannibal Lecter says something about how um, Buffalo Bill is not a real transsexual. He thinks he is. He tries to be. I bet he's tried a bunch of things, I expect. Something like that. And that's a bigger part of the book where um, uh, James Gum has applied for um, like uh, gender surgery mm-hmm. and has been denied because that's not uh, his like true identity, I guess. But I... I recommend a Lindsay Ellis video who goes into like the uh, history of uh, trans representation in film. She talks a lot about um, uh, some like major pictures that were important, and this is one of them, but um, n- not handled the best. This no, time. it's yeah. 1991. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and there was a lot of backlash. The movie won many awards, but there was also a lot of controversy surrounding. Yeah, and 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 I think what you were talking about about like bills applications it's like there's kind of some little bit of exposition later that talks about like oh yeah well he applied it that there are three main places where it's like johns hopkins and i don't remember what they list but the, for and, sex reassignment mm-hmm. right 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 to like look into that and see if they've if they were denied and whatever and, yeah um, which like none of this terminology would be like chill today no but, no. Um, no yeah i guess thomas harris tried to like sort of sidestep that because he realized that um he was putting sort of like a dangerous idea into pop culture. Yeah. Yeah. That trans people were monsters. Yeah. Yep. yep. Because if, for, throughout all of the 90s, like this movie was so big. And then you see so many instances of people where like, um, oh, trans people are like dangerous or they're crazy or, mm-hmm. you know, they're like a laughing stock, which yeah. is obviously not true. But um, it kind of perpetuated this idea. Um, and you see the same thing in like Psycho in the mm-hmm. 60s. And Oh, totally. Yeah. And. What was the movie Sleepaway Camp? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Although I watched that a couple months ago, I don't know. I, I feel differently about it now because oh. uh, how do I not spoil it? It ultimately it's about someone who's uh, being forced to be an identity that they are not oh. like that is not their true identity. I see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, I actually felt kind of better about Sleepaway Camp, um, and I also really enjoyed that last scene. Yeah, just it, it's off putting. You bet. Have I haven't you seen, seen it in so long. Oh, you should long. watch Sleep. Oh, you've seen it before, though? Yeah. I When I was in high school, a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't shocking because of the person's, like, true identity, but more like what transpired to get to this okay. moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like, whoa, this is actually uh, amazing. Okay. Yeah, but uh, not handled great here. Well, too, and I think, to the actor who played Buffalo Bill, Ted Levine, and Jonathan Demme, both, I, I mean, I guess you could say they defend or they back up their choices and say, no, we're not doing X, Y, and Z against trans people. Um, mm-hmm. Demme says, he wasn't a gay character. He was a tormented man who hated himself and wished he was a woman because that would have made him as far away from himself as he possibly could be. And there's a few other quotes from him and Ted Levine. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, still, if you think about it, like this, some of the backlash was about um, like homophobia, violence against women. There are so many things you could pick apart. But when I watch this movie, like in like early high school, like I wasn't, I don't remember that. I don't remember the backlash. Yeah. I don't remember. Um, I think more it was like so influential that like a bunch of people with less uh, <clears throat> grace <laughs> took that idea and ran with it. Sure. Yeah. But in the book, um, yeah, he's not transgender at all. It's just that he's so um, he was so heavily abused that he like hates himself so deeply mm-hmm. that he's like trying to find mm. any identity that works. I read something about too, like his relationship with his mother. But then one thing too, one of the commentary things I watched that just dis- that discussed some of the um, the backlash and problems with it, and then they noted that the film he, that Jonathan Demme made after this film was Philadelphia. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Right. So. Hmm. So I don't know. That was just a couple years later. Anyways, I mean, there's a lot of any movie, like this is 1991. There's so many things you can pick apart about, like, you know. It's true. Yeah. Misogyny, sexism, like homophobia, like it, racism, it's rampant, like it, everything just, and things are glossed over more than. 
As the manhunt for Buffalo Bill begins, Starling travels to Lecter's special cell in a local Tennessee courthouse where she confronts him about the false information he gave the senator. Lecter refuses Starling's pleas and demands she finish her story surrounding her worst childhood memory. After recounting her arrival at a relative's farm, the horror of discovering their lamb slaughterhouse and her fruitless attempts at rescuing the lambs, they screamed as they were being slaughtered, a memory that has haunted her her whole life, Lecter rebuffs her, leaving her with the case file before she is escorted out of the building by security guards. As she reaches for the file, he touches one of her fingers. <laughs> I don't know why they decided <laughs> Close to Close up of that. Yeah, that, which is whatever. Um, later that evening, Lecter escapes from his cell. His two minders distracted by having to move his sketches and tricking them into approaching him too closely. Local police storm the floor, discovering one guard barely alive and the other disemboweled and strung up on the bars of Lecter's cage like an angel. Love it. Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> that's one of the coolest set things I've ever seen. Another um, American flag. Yeah, another big, yeah, that's right. And scaffolding. Anyway, they had to set, they had to do a lot of work to set up that cell for him. That was so, <laughs> that scene is awesome. That is one I will watch and yep. watch yep. and watch. Paramedics transport the survivor to to an ambulance and speed off while a SWAT team searches the building for Lecter. As the team discover a body on top of the elevator car, the survivor in the ambulance peels off his own face, revealing Lecter in disguise, who kills the paramedics and escapes to the airport. Yeah, this is where we get into a scene that makes me forget about Buffalo Bill entirely. <laughs> like, I, th I, I've seen this movie a million times. I always associate this with being the end of the movie, and it isn't. Huh. This... This is one of the best bait and switches I've ever seen. Uh, I was completely fooled by it the first time I ever saw it. It's so elaborate. There are so many things to, that you're that you're paying attention to. I love it so much. This is easily my favorite part of the movie. This has one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie, which is Starling's friend Ardelia running frantically oh, yeah. down the hall mm -hmm. and you're as the viewer you're piecing together oh god they've and they haven't told you what's happening but you've just obviously pieced it together by what you've seen in the ambulance mm -hmm. and by the body in the elevator and then she's just running yeah yeah oh i know she's running down the hall before the ambulance scene which is why it's such a great scene mm -hmm. i think clarice that, isn't to tell clarice that Lecter isn't escaped. it right after he rips the face off like after he pulls the mask off in the ambulance then it cuts to the phone falling and she's running down the hall I because you know she's running to tell Clarice that Hannibal escaped. Right. Okay. Maybe. Maybe I think I've got that's to... what it is. Cause anyway, it's... but it's just something about that running. It's so good. It's, yeah. I just love that. Yeah. The urgent sense of urgency. Yes. Yeah. Frantic. Yeah. That and that that cell set up in the gymnasium or whatever that room is because it's a courthouse. Um, is it's that's a really cool set piece. You get another really great interview between Clarice and and Lecter. You also get the funniest mustache I've maybe ever seen on that police officer. Oh. Uh, Charles you Napier? Know no. Wait, is that who that is? That Charles Napier is Boyle. It's the one that goes like straight across his face. Like it's really thin. He's, um, <laughs> Oh, it's boy. I, you, I don't think it is him. I can't believe Boyle. you all weren't nearly as taken with this mustache as I was. <laughs> Boyle is the, like the, the desk sergeant, or something, the guy in charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to me, they were just man one, man two, man, yeah. man three. Right, right, right. I don't know what you're talking about. Man 974. <laughs> oh no, Charles Napier. I no, he's he's the one that gets uh, handcuffed to the to the. Um, oh yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah. Of course. I'm thinking of the guy who, um, he's Sergeant Tate, I think. Okay. What are you talking about? Hold on, I'm gonna show you. <laughs> I literally don't even know. Well, the funny thing is, none of the characters are identified. Oh, the two guards that are the bu the bumbling this idiots. This guy, look at his mustache. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. that's oh, true. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's true. That guy. Yeah. I, I see why you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's because yeah, it's it's a really tense scene. Then it's broken a little bit by how weird and wide his mustache is. <laughs> The, so the other thing I love is that 
Hannibal immediately jumps back to Clarice's childhood and yep. he doesn't even miss a beat and he's he's back with that question grilling her about what happened. Yep. Yeah. yeah. His stare's super intense too, especially when he's looking right at the camera. It's like, oh, yeah. Jesus. Well, he's almost he's in a position up above her too, so it mm-hmm. makes it even more. And there's a bunch of shots from where he's looking down into the camera in this like including when he's mm-hmm. flogging him with the nightstick which is oh that that's a good scene yeah and it's like big <sighs> that he's doing when he's doing it it's like Ugh. a release it's like exercise for him i like his little hands going with the music afterwards yes he's like covered in blood and he's got blood all over his mouth and he's i forget what he says and the music is playing yep. and then he looks down at the tape recorder yep. he's an artiste <laughs> and he says something to the officer that's still kind of alive before he goes over and then does his like he says something like are you ready now or something like that something. i'll be i'll be seeing you now or something like that and then and then he proceeds to, i don't know how he had time or strength to do everything that he did in that gymnasium. Also, <laughs> so my question is why are there no cameras on that room? It's like a makeshift cell. Yeah, it's like I wonder if, it, well, I'm thinking about what closed circuit television would have been like in 1991. It's like, they well, had, you would think. They had them in this, the previous cell. I know. Well, and they had to get a scaffolding guy to come in and yeah. put up fly rig shit all Anyway. You but, put a cage in the middle of the room and surround it by, like, that's. No, like, that's <laughs> enough. We got some spotlights on him. We'll put two cops on him at a little child's desk (laughs) there was um in one of the commentary things that that the the imagery of that cage in the center of the room it was modeled after like a a famous artist i forget the name Mm. but there was like a a painting yeah yeah oh right and there's and if you see the painting you're like oh yeah there's a lot of like art history references Mm -hmm. like right before they show uh like Lecter has like this little um sketching of clarice holding the lamb it's kind of like a pieta he did that shit quick yeah (laughs) I also like how some of these, like, art, the music in it and some of the art or some of the things that it was based on goes along with Lecter as a person, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. how how much he enjoyed that world, that highbrow, you know, world. He's there is one, artful in his killings. One of the d- deleted scenes, there's a scene of... Um, this is a really fun scene. There's a scene in the ambulance of Lecter driving it and driving away oh, after, shit. and he's like laughing and smiling as really? he's driving after he took the ambulance away. Yeah. Oh, I'm you glad they like, deleted that, but I I would love yeah. to see it. It didn't need to be in the movie, but it's like yakety sacks is playing. <laughs> since you own the the Criterion I know, I, I, I've got to watch that. And there's there's not very many deleted scenes yeah. or um, bloopers, but that was a deleted one, and I'm like. What? <laughs> just a guy covered in it's blood like, driving an ambulance. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yep. He's just like down the going through the tunnel. I like, got s- I might have to, talk I might, about maximum overdrive. Yeah. That's awesome. God, that's great. I thought you would appreciate that. I do appreciate that. <laughs> um, a couple other little details in this. Um, yeah, the crucified police officer like disemboweled is so that's cool. it's horrifying and it just looks it looks great it's the best shot in the movie I think. yeah and it has that huge swell of the score that happens that just oh yeah everything about this this scene is special how did he have time to do all of that i don't know <laughs> it just how do you get him up it's there such art. <laughs> it's i like imagining him like chilling on top of the elevator putting that guy face yeah, down just right. like riding it up and down it needs to be like a home alone type sequence where he's setting up all his little movie trap things <laughs> he, has to, yeah. <laughs> he has well, to be like incredibly fit to be able to do all that's a lot yeah 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 He's got that pen. I'm sure that helped a lot. That's true. As he, yeah, <laughs> he's, he's on top of the cage. Pen. He's just yeah. He's sitting behind his little privacy thing, trying to trying to barf up that piece of the pen so that he can <laughs> he then do the most How elaborate are not, thing. Like, blood drips all over. He like is wearing somebody else's face, and then to get the body on the elevator, like where is that? And when he's laying on the ground, like. After you've seen this movie and you know that it's him laying there, it's like you can definitely you can see Anthony Hopkins like features under the like fleshy thing, but it but when they're up close to him where he's like, Hold his hand, talk to him, damn it. Yeah. There's like these really gross bubbles that really are coming out of his I, mouth I which I, are just ugh. Yeah. 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 Or I, then when he's being wheeled out and he starts like fake flailing. kicking like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. seizure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, fake seizure. Yeah. He's having a little tantrum on yeah. his way out. <laughs> Also, just in the middle of this, inexplicably, when the FBI show up, Chris Isaac is mm-hmm. one of the agents. Mm-hmm. Very distracting to me. 
Yeah. Um, yes. Oh. He's, yeah. Been, he's been in other Demi stuff too. Yeah. He gets one line. Okay, guys. <laughs> yeah, I saw his name in the credits. I was like, what? Yeah. 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 I saw it. he's he's billed he's highly billed at some point. I think in the beginning of the movie, but then you watch the end credits and it's like he's way down. Yeah. Maybe oh, it's because it's by chronological order. I oh. think I had to go back. And find where he was in the movie. Yeah, just because one scene outside just the for a second. Yeah, and yeah. he looks so ineffective as a SWAT team yeah. commander. <laughs> yeah, that whole yeah. team outside the elevator. There is a woman in that scene who is not uh, Clarice. Bunch of bumblers. Bunch yep. of bum- yeah, like all of them. When they're all looking up at like, the oh, what? yeah, yeah, they all. There. They bust in the door, and it's like, what is this, an Avengers movie? They're right. All playing in and then one of them just has a little ladder. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you get the ladder? Just, yeah. There was just was some guy painting down Got the Got my hall. little SWAT ladder. <laughs> and-, <laughs> and after having seen so many, like, and this, this is a good movie. I just feel like they yeah. needed a little more realistic cop, FBI, Major manhunt situation, but I like I like that they're all bumbling. Like it 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 builds the tension because you're watching them and you're going, "You fucking idiots! What are you doing?" But, all of them feels yeah. like real life. It does feel like real <laughs> life. But yeah, Chris Isaac, and this would have been at the height of his his like. I, so I guess Wicked Game was yeah, like a song in 1990. Yeah. So, oh, it's before. Shit. Yeah. All so right. he so he would have been pretty famous. So it was probably like, hey, we can get him. Why not? That's the but he was another John and the Demi stuff too. Mm-hmm. Oh, is he? I'm not super familiar with Jonathan Demme's other stuff. Oh. Also, this scene has Brent Hinckley, who is Bobby, in this. He's just another bumbling cop. Oh, and he just he looks like a bumbling cop. Yeah, he has yeah, the perfect yeah. dumb guy face. Exactly. <laughs> no offense to him, like, yeah. but he gets cast as a dumb guy a yes. lot. Yeah, Aww. and he shows up in a very famous uh, Buffy episode. Is he the one that says Sergeant Tate? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. When they're when they notice the elevator stop, yeah, yeah. I think it's him. Yeah, he's, he's real dopey. Yeah, that's when you really get a good look at that guy's mustache. <laughs> anyway, we need to have a, a another tab in our spreadsheet mustaches. Yeah, <laughs> we do have mustaches of the pod. We have some good ones. I if I remember correctly, I mean you you've got Tom Skerritt, although that's more of a beard. Anyway, yeah. I really like that um, Hannibal Lecter asked for a second dinner of lamb chops. Extra rare. Extra rare. And they're like, funny. they have that little bit of like uh, of exposition about it just to really rub your face in it. And they're like, what's it going to get next? Something from the zoo or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I like how also they're so like casual and unaffected over the human that they are supposed to be guarding over. Yes. There's like, er, er. Yeah. Well, they even like when they're talking to Starling when she comes into interview, they they're kind of like, you know, the deal with him, you know, you're supposed to like, I don't know, not get close to him or something, and then they immediately get fucking close yeah. to him. Uh-huh. You know what? Because Chilton is bad at his job yeah. and is a terrible human being. Yeah, yeah. This is all Chilton. He plucked this guy, put him here. It's all Chilton. Yeah, it's all Chilton, and these are his cop buddies. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> my wife pointed out that like in his cell, he has a. So, like, they won't have a lot of shoelaces, but he has a tape recorder with a tape in it. He has a metal tray, implements for sketching. Like, you know, there yeah. are there are a lot of things that he could have gotten in trouble with, but instead he sat in his little his little privacy spot and barfed up the pen <laughs> or however he got it up there. Jodie Foster in the commentary has, like, an interesting point where she says, um, like, the movie's all about power dynamics and this is a scene where Clar- Clarice has been like taken off the case and she's basically like I'll give you everything and I don't care if I get hurt in the process but she like wants so badly to save um, Catherine that she's like willing to do anything to get that next piece of information that she needs yeah when they're kind of like pulling her away as Chilton comes in and, and she's just like tell me his name Tell me. she's super desperate in that also, one of the little paper things that popped up during this was, uh, <laughs> though it's rare for serial killers to escape from custody, it has happened in the past. In 1977, Ted Bundy escaped incarceration in Colorado, mm-hmm. right. not once but twice. He wasn't apprehended again until early the next year after he had murdered three college students in yeah. Florida. Did it say that he stopped in Ann Arbor for a quick beer to watch he? a game? Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. Where? Did it, do we know where? Um. I think the name of the bar is, you, if you look online, but I don't, it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, uh, yeah. because of that. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's I think interesting. He was after Colorado before Florida. I don't remember. Bad guy. That Bad one. Guy. One cool thing, thinking about how much the male gaze exists in this movie and how little women look. I do. I like that Jodie Foster's name is before Anthony Hopkins's name. It should be. She's you yeah, bet. the star. He's also but, only in like 20 minutes of this movie. He is the shortest. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Of someone who's won Best Actor or whatever the hell. Wow. Yeah, it's like 16 to 20 minutes. Wow. Huh. So, after being notified of Lecter's escape, Starling pours over the case file, analyzing Lecter's annotations before realizing that the first victim, Frederica Bimmel, knew Bill in real life before he killed her. Starling travels to Bimmel's hometown and discovers that she was a tailor and has dresses with templates identical to the patches of skin removed from Buffalo Bill's victims. Realizing that Buffalo Bill is a tailor fashioning a woman's suit of real skin, she telephones Crawford, who is already on the way to make an arrest, having cross-referenced Lecter's notes with Johns Hopkins Hospital and finding a man named James Gum or Jamie Gum. Crawford instructs Starling to continue interviewing Bimmel's friends while he leads a SWAT team to Gum's business address in Calumet City, Illinois. Starling's interviews lead to the house of Jack Gordon, whom Starling soon realizes is actually Gum and draws her weapon just as Gum disappears into his basement. Starling pursues him into the basement, which consists of several rooms. That is an understatement. <laughs> Discovering a screaming Catherine Martin in a dry well. The lights in the basement suddenly go out, leaving her in complete darkness. Gum stalks Starling into the dark with night vision goggles and prepares to shoot her when Starling, hearing the clicks with the drawing back of the hammer on his revolver, swivels around and shoots Gum dead. Um, it feels like a huge disservice to sum up this scene like that. <laughs> pow, pow. Scariest fucking... <laughs> This whole scene is so damn scary. And um, who is the person rotting in the bathtub? Mrs. Lipman. Okay. And how does he have this? How is he living there? I think he killed her. Okay. And then he just keeps paying. He just stays. I want to know how he sells electricity. Well, if he just keeps sending money for the accounts that are in her name. And he knows that she's dead. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, of course, this final confrontation is taking place in fucking Ohio. Is there yeah. a worse state? <laughs> yeah, fuck you, Ohio. In Belvedere. <laughs> right. Oh, oh, yeah. There's I, a... Oh, right at the beginning of the movie. Oh, yeah, Lecter when he's just says, like, the Belvedere from the... From the Duomo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. It's like a clue, because the end of the movie takes place in Belvedere, Ohio. Mm. And he's telling her what city james gum is in okay. i've seen this movie i don't know how many times that i didn't put that together I never put that together you guys that's great that's great also his name is james gum because his mom didn't care and just spelled his name wrong on the birth certificate that's why his name isn't james or but, jamie or whatever yeah yeah it's not a name <laughs> <laughs> um Another song that is forever tarnished by this movie is Goodbye Horses. <laughs> I don't think, I, much more so uh, to a much greater degree. That's yeah. a creepier one for me. Sure. You bet. Mm-hmm. There's, because you can hear the echo of the basement in the song. It's, oh. there's just something about it that, yeah, it's. Because you can hear her screaming and. Screaming and like the. He's just dancing. And yeah. I also didn't. I never noticed this before. Maybe I did. Don't remember noticing that he was wearing a wig that was the scalp of another person. Yeah, and mm. I love again that close up of his face, and you're able to see the scalp line. Yeah, of the, his wig. Yeah, and we get like a really we get a couple of clear shots at the skin suit, mm-hmm. um, which weirdly blend in with all the other ephemera in the basement. Um, <laughs> There's a lot. Like I almost want to watch it like in slow mo to see a bunch all of swastikas of, in there. Yeah. The, the bedspread. Yeah, I'm like, oh, it's bedspread. Hand, hand quilt that. Some <laughs> old World War II propaganda stuff. There's um, a poster that says, America, open your eyes. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I yep. had to pause it and to try to read that poster. Sheeple, wake up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I like, uh, yeah, that was a good scene with him dancing and her screaming. And that is that when she's also trying to catch, She's trying to get Precious, get precious down there. She's trying to, to get him down there with a bone. Yeah, yeah. So with the chicken those bones. Those two are the... just extra creepy before you even get to the the, the night vision scene or yeah. see more of the Well, any of the like basement. the switch of the FBI showing up at the wrong house and they're ringing mm-hmm. the doorbell. That is such a great and effective switch where they're ringing the doorbell and the 
that loud, terrible buzzing is happening in the basement, yep. and you think like, oh shit, they're they yeah. found him, and then it's the the whole the whole parallel editing. Then it's a long scene. The whole amazing. It's, well it's done. so good. It's so good. Yeah. And this is like a classic example of the par- parallel editing. Yeah, it's it's it, so it, that tension though, man. That tension, it's so real. And it's so good. I heard, you know he's going to the wrong. You know they're going to the wrong house. You're yeah. Like, no. No. I don't think. I think the again the first time I saw it, I don't think I knew. I think I just was. Well, they show a picture of the guy they're going to get, and it's the wrong guy. Really? Well, no, no, no. That's definitely him. In the when they're on the, on the plane, airplane? yeah, that's definitely him. He just looks. It's like a. It's like an official photo. I think it might even be his headshot, huh. like oh, the actor's yeah. headshot. He it's totally definitely him. Him. Yeah, they're going to his like registered house, right? And not Mrs. Lippman's house, which right. is why that doesn't work out. Oh, then maybe my error of noticing the picture, like, maybe think that's not his house. That's the other guy's house. <laughs> I mean, either oh, well, way, sorry, it gets young a, me. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, it's. But you know, for for a climactic, horrible, scary scene. There are no jump scares in this. Mm-hmm. No. There, there are no like classic setups. It's just, it's done so horribly. It's only yeah. suspense. Right. And it's, and just this awfulness of being alone and trapped mm-hmm. and preyed on. And you're not alone. He's right. fucking watching right. you. Yeah. And she's like, her and night vision looking around, feeling around, bumping into stuff. Like mm-hmm. you just feel helpless. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And her, I was, <laughs> I don't know why I thought about this so much, but like, so she's gasping and panting the whole time. And all I can think is, what does it smell like down there? Oh, There's yes. a rotting body in the bathroom that she comes upon right before the lights go out too. Mm-hmm. So it gives you like an extra ugh, before, <laughs> before that happens. And like, I'm sure the skin suit doesn't smell good. Um mm-hmm. And there's definitely going to be mold problems down yeah. there. <laughs> I too, I like, it took you, her, during the night vision scene where you know that she's being followed by him, it takes you back to that beginning training scene yes, where she has the gun to the back of the head, you're dead, darling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It takes you back to that because she's using some of that, you can see her as, she's still a student, like right. being, I'm like, oh, but there's someone behind you. Yeah. Well, before the lights go out, she's doing a a great job of clearing. She's checking all her corners. Yeah, she's checking all the corners. She's looking in one room, closing it, putting a door or a um, a chair up to the door so that no one can come back in. Or like a shovel. It was. It was. Was It it was a shovel. shovel. And and all I could think when so when she was doing all that, it's just like, do you even know where those rooms go? Like I like because I was trying to picture where they went, and she's like, are you just trapping yourself? Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, it's like it's like the overlook. The rooms connect in ways that don't actually <laughs> exactly. exist. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when I, when I she first gets to the house, you you know that's him. It's so creepy. It's so and you know she's going to go into the house. Um, I love that one of the the tells is the spools of thread with the moth fluttering around mm-hmm. it. Like your heart just like stops. That's when she gets really serious. And, and then like, she's like, oh, this is the guy. This is the yeah. guy. And then he's just fumbling around like, I ain't got a car. Got, got, got oh, a car. Oh, 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 <laughs> and it's, and there's a moment where they look at each other and they both know that the jig is up. And well, and, it's and so can I use your phone? Good. And he laughs after, cause like, cause she was like, <laughs> put the phone like send the phone down and he oh god it's yeah. such and then it's, you see this giant gun on top of the stove yeah it's just good and she kind of she fumbles pulling her gun out a little bit just to mm-hmm. remind you she's a rookie and mm-hmm. like and, and even to picking up the rookiness of even though she was checking her spaces she was still terrified in that moment like when the lights were out and you, you could hear things and couldn't see anything like yeah. and as a viewer that's a huge loss of like power and yeah. space and self Oof. not being able to and I still think it's interesting that when we do see the light, it's she sees him because when the gun when the gun goes off, that the the flare is yeah. it illuminates the room for her to see where he is. Yeah, and then the window so, busts and like yeah, the the back and forth between her and night vision, and then just like the illuminator from overhead, mm-hmm. like you can just see his hairline and the and the night vision goggles. Also, just, there's a little American flag in, in yep, the window. Yep, oh. next to the spinning thing yeah. with the yeah, it's yeah. That's the I, that was the other American flag, flag that I noticed. Um, yeah, she was an American girl. <laughs> so I'm just a little bit confused at the timeline of this guy took over Mrs. Lipman's house, mm-hmm. and the first victim 
used to help Mrs. Lipman with sewing, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Frederica. Right. So was that guy there the whole I mean I I It's not the, a big deal. In the book they're but, friends. James Gum and Frederica are friends and right. they sew together for right. Miss Lipman. But then how does that pull in Buffalo Bill's sewing? Probably she just had all the stuff at her house. Oh, maybe. And he's oh, into okay. sewing. Of course. Too. They're both into right. it. Right. Yeah. They're both into sewing. But it's just that she had everything at her house, so it was just a convenient coincidence that he took and over that And she had the house. well. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> she had the bucket. Right. <laughs> right. Chicken bones. And, yeah. No, it is yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah. About I was just, that relationship <clears throat> and how yeah. it formed. It's like there's it, there's a bit of a leap there, but I but it's one that I buy. Yeah. Because yeah. it's just like, oh, the, the, the opportunity of she has this house – She's elderly, so we can take advantage. Yeah, I don't know if I, I, it, I don't know. Does it make sense for me to read the book? Is there more insight into characters or story or anything? Like, I just, um, I just don't know. I remember really liking all the detail because, um, it like put, like, in the same way that the, like, uh, uh, close ups on everyone's face puts you in, like, the shoes, all of the little details, you're trying to put it together too. So you're like, yeah. oh shit, like, I remember being terrified in the scene where she finds the head because like it's longer and she's just looking around in the dark and like all this weird, like she's finding all kinds of weird, I think it'd be worth it, but I would only read this one. <laughs> I wouldn't sure. read the whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I can see why reading the book and getting all that extra detail would be really good. But as somebody who's seen this movie many times, there's details that I don't know. Like I don't know, you know, Hannibal's background. I don't know how these characters are all, Meet. I don't know much about James Gunn, but I don't need to. I yeah. know enough by watching the movie. But anytime, I mean, they always say, oh, the book is better than the movie. The book, you've got more word. There's more time. Yeah. You, know, you have way more than two hours or an hour and a half, you know. Well, they're totally different mediums. So, mm-hmm. like, this is a great adaptation because it keeps all of the most important stuff and sort of loses all of the extra detail. Like, does the audience, does the viewing audience need to know that James Gum went and mm-hmm. like tried to find a bunch of different uh, like hospitals to do like surgery on him? No, but it's an interesting detail because it fleshes out like each character. Because I think one of the strengths of the story is that everyone is a person. Like there's no good guy or bad guy. Everybody has their strengths and weaknesses and um, like weird quirks, and they end up feeling like actual people as opposed to characters. Um, and so the extra detail helps um, with that in a book setting. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I love how upset Buffalo Bill gets when she's got the dog. Fuck yeah. He's yeah. like, it's like the most out of control you see him the entire time. He's oh, just it's, like, yeah. come I mean, show me. A hurt dog, dog is a, dog. that's a great motivator. <laughs> I like, I, my dog was sitting on my lap while that scene was happening and I would have been very upset too if the person I trapped in the well had my dog. Yeah. <laughs> that was very smart of her to try to do yeah. that. Yeah. And I love that she is trying to get, she's trying to save herself. She's not, not yeah. like waiting because as she can see by the nails, like help may yeah. not come. Help probably won't come actually. Yeah. And well, and we see her like kind of try and fail at first mm-hmm. before the dog then <laughs> <laughs> hilariously looks back over the well and just goes, bop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Second best scene. Try again. <laughs> yeah. I also love, yeah. you can really feel um, Catherine's desperation yeah. and she's trying everything because when she's seen the red the red blood on the side from somebody else's fingernail, she was like, no, 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 I'm not getting out of here. Yeah. And that's the only tool she has, you know, the only tool she has against him yeah. that this... she could possibly use is to use the dog. And I also like that when she's leaving, when she eventually does get rescued, she she's carrying the dog and blubbering yeah. with it. I'm like, you know what? That dog is going to go and live with her now. But I'm yeah. also I'm like, do you really want to keep that dog? No. No one wants that, that dog. Was so <laughs> precious. Yeah. Sorry, oh. good dog. Uh, yeah, that dog is full of nothing but bad yeah. memories. She named oh. it, then yeah. she named it Patty Hearst. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Catherine, scared and holding the white dog, kind of mirrors Clarice as a child trying to carry the, the lamb. lamb. Yeah. Oh, of course. Silence of the Lambs. I did really like that, and I know this happened earlier in the movie, but I did really like when he was in that second cell. And she was telling that story that was just guttural and yeah. terrible. And you really felt all of, you know, because when she got there, there was such a such a, a sense of urgency. Mm-hmm. And then he got her to slow down and she was sharing that very personal, like terrifying story. And yeah. I liked how that tied in the title. And yep. 
Yeah. Yeah, Because the imagery for this movie is so, like all the posters and stuff is all about the moth. Mm -hmm. All about the moth. I did like one of the things in the the extra content on the Blu-ray or whatever was about, you know, the moths and taking care of them. And I really like the the moth guy, the moth. Yeah. What do they call him? Uh, he was like the moth, the moth wrangler. Culture. Oh, in the actual the, on the, the movie the, set. The, yeah, the, uh, the real person who was oh. doing that. So, am I remembering this right? In other movies, is there a whole thing about uh, the imago and the chrysalis and the transformation? Does this ring a bell? In the other all animal the related other Hannibal movies, there's a transformation thing in Red Dragon, and I can't remember Hannibal, but yes, because because. In Red Dragon, he's trying. He's trying to transform into the yeah. I the, like, anyway, oh your deity. Yeah, the right. Two. Do you see? But um, for this, I took Ed the we'll moth. This, yeah. I took the moth into sort of the transformation of Buffalo Bill and trying to become something else. Yeah. I don't know if it's Red Dragon or not, but in one of the um, other like later books. Um, Lecter and Clarice run away together. They're like in love and it's different in the movie. I think that's Hannibal sort of, isn't it? It wasn't in Hannibal the movie. Right. Also in Hannibal the TV show, Jillian Anderson is in it. Hmm. With a little nice. As Clarice. Cross, crossover. <laughs> no, I had to start calling her Clarice instead of Starling because yeah. that be some, there has to be some really great fan fiction with those two in it. So days later at the FBI Academy graduation party, Starling receives a phone call from Hannibal Lecter, who's now in the Bahamas. Love it. As Lecter assures Starling he has no plans to pursue her, he excuses himself from the phone call, remarking that he's having an old friend for dinner before hanging up and following Dr. Chilton through the streets of the village. And then the credits roll. Pitch perfect ending yeah. to this movie. I agree. Because you I... feel like everything is fine. Everything's safe. But when she... Like she lets out like a like a sigh to pick up the phone, and is and you did, you have no reason to think that that's going to be Lecter. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you're the viewer yeah. and you've seen this movie before. Um, <laughs> it's also great how there's just a silence, and you can he's walking down the street, and you can he, still he, I hear her voice saying Doctor Lecter, Doctor Lecter, yeah. like over and over. Yeah, I'm yeah, really, really powerful. Um, I also have a confession to make. So when he's sitting there saying he's having an old friend for dinner, there are people getting off a plane and there's like an elderly couple. Literally, I thought he was going to eat the elderly just couple. Eat this old I, guy. <laughs> I did not notice that Chilton was the guy the in Chilton. the background. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, that's even better. Yeah, it really is. Well, yeah. the scene with the end credits where those people are just walking and the music is playing and the street becomes more and more sparse is so sad and lonely. I love this as the last scene of the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also love when there's something to look at during credits. Like yep. it's not just a black screen. Yeah, I watched them. I, w I was... And plus, he's just in the, the hat and the linen suit. Yeah. He's on and, vacation. And then he kind of blends in after a certain point. It's just like if you look away for a second as he's walking away, you can kind of lose him. So, and it's so scary cool. because you're like, he's out there. He's out there. He's out there, and it's unclear if he's going to do anything bad to anybody bad. <laughs> or anybody good, I should say. Yeah, well, He's going to do it to Chilton. He's going to get Chilton, and that rules. That's the movie. That's Silence of the Lambs. Any other thoughts before we get into our uh, our rankings that I haven't thought about at all? I never think about them. Yeah. It's always spur of the Knee moment, jerk. which uh, explains a lot. <laughs> which is why all my scores are almost the same. It's I hard. like the movies we watch. Yeah. I think well, I think what's interesting about this movie, too, is you think about like the music done by Howard Shore. He's done so many movies, <laughs> such different styles. Same thing with Jonathan Demme. And same thing with the actors. It's just interesting looking at this huge catalog of things that they've individually created and then to come together this skill and talent to put together like like a psychological like thriller horror that just like wins a bunch of Oscars. It's just very interesting. And in 1991, I think that's so interesting. Yeah. Is this this is the first thing that we've watched that won Oscars, right? I don't mm -hmm. think anything else. Did Alien win anything for special effects? I don't think so. No. Um I think this is one of the was few nope nominated for anything. No, not a single thing. Damn. Which one? What? What? Nope. Nope. I didn't. I knew really? nope didn't win hmm. anything. But I thought maybe it would have been. No, it was totally shut out. 
I, I think Silence of the Lambs is one of the very few horror movies that has ever been nominated, let alone for one. For anything, yeah. Did Howard Shore win Oscars Nobody. for for the Lord of the Rings music also? Because that one won a bunch of Oscars, but that's not What? Cool. That's him? Howard Shore did the music. Yeah. Also, Jonathan Demme directed one of the, like, the best concert film of all time, Stop Making yeah, Sense. Yeah, right. The, the Talking Heads documentary. If you look at like their individual like things they've done, it's so like wide ranging. It's interesting that they all came together on this supremely fucked up movie. Yeah, because it just feels very out of. Yeah, it uh, like it doesn't it doesn't make sense that he would have directed something like this. But, but also but. for some people, I guess some of the movies like Lord of the Rings stuff came later, or some of the other movies that Demi worked on came later, yeah. or after, post Silence of the Lambs. But yeah, uh, but like he did the movie. For Music for big. I don't know. I just think it's amazing. Yeah, I'm looking through his credit. It's it's one of those names that I've seen a million times, and I just it's easy to forget everything that. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, he did Crimes of the Future, which I still haven't seen yet. Oh, that boy. new Cronenberg movie. I haven't heard good things about it, but oh. I will watch it because it's I like that stuff. Oh, I love you. Have thoughts? Good. Yeah. Good. That's what I want to hear. I mean, I loved it because it was Cronenberg and it was really, really a Cronenberg movie. Yeah. Good. And the fly? No. What are you talking about? Um, Crimes of Crimes the Future. Crimes of the Future. It was somebody at the library told me to see it. Might have been Heidi. Hmm. And I was so happy to finally watch it. And it was definitely a Cronenberg sure. movie. So that's what made me so happy about it. Good. Oh, Howard Shore. <laughs> Also did the score for Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, <laughs> that's a movie I know. Um, Ed Wood, which I love. Oh yeah. Um, Seven, that thing you do, Crash, Striptease, Copland, The Game. Analyze this. Uh, High Fidelity, that's cool. Lots of lots of stuff, but won the Oscar for um, Lord of the Rings: Return of the King that year. That it just like they were like, I don't know, we'll just give absolutely every 11. award to them, which was yeah, which. After a certain point, I was like, listen, I love these movies, but other good things came out. Right. You can you can spread the wealth a little bit. So who wants to go first? Christopher does. <laughs> 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 All right. On the magnificent scarometer that is out of five points, I'm going to give this a two. I could go a little higher just because I think all the leering men really make this movie scarier. That's one of the real horrors of this, I think. Uh, But I'm going to go with two on that. And on the movie rating, I'm going to give this a 7.5. Unfortunately, this movie is slightly spoiled for me by all the popular references to it. So it's lost just a little bit of its edge, unfortunately. But... um, uh, let me just say, so many parts of this, including the editing, are magnificent. So that's a 7.5. Nice. Very solid. Nice. I think this is one of the scarier movies we watched. I think, and I mentioned a little bit of this earlier about that this is the this is a real monster. This is a human. These are real human things, like the human psyche and like mental illness in ways you can hurt yourself and others. For me, that was big. Also, the way the movie was done with so much tension, so much suspense, and then um, the terror and the treatment for for Jodie Foster, the terror she felt, or the things she had to go through as a, as a woman in this world, I think it was just well put together, and I think it was really well done, and it's scary. Like, Dr. Lecter, like, scary AF, like, legit scary. Um so this is out of a five point scale. I'll give it a three out of five. I'll give it a three out of five. And it's funny because the other one of the this is our tenth movie that we're doing for this show. The other one that for me that was the most scary was Alien. And they're they're two of like the quote unquote like best of the best of the horror movies that we watched for this, not just like really good bad things. Um so I'll give it a did I say three? Mm-hmm. All right, I already said. <laughs> three, I already just said. Um, no, I'll stick with the three. I'll give it a three out of five. So I think there's definitely some scariness. Um, humanity is scary. Humanity is scary. And then for the overall ranking, I do, and I will say, I, th- I do think it's a perfect film, but I do have a hard time with the cringiness of some of the. I feel like my ranking I would have given it in 1995 is different than I want to give it now because I do think it's a perfect film. But some of the cringiness and some of the, 
and I know part of it is the misogyny and the tr- that was just the culture of you know this male dominated world, but it's just really hard to to just to watch and you just I want to just throw tomatoes at the screen whenever <laughs> there's a, just a guy being a total jerk. Um, Fun. I'll I'll give it a nine out of ten, which is is like the same thing. But anyways, I'll give it a nine out of ten. Great, great, great film. List the acting, the writing, the music, the the lighting, the sets, the editing. Really thoughtful. A lot went into it. A lot of heart and a lot of thought. And I also think it's really it's great when you. And again, I haven't read any of the books, but I think it's a really it's an adaptation where I feel like people haven't ripped it apart for being an adaptation of you know it's being so divergent from the source material Mm -hmm. so um i am also going to give it a two out of five um it was definitely scarier than some of the other movies we've seen and i liked a lot of the like gorier scenes um particularly that like flayed man on the um the bars of the cell um one thing that i think is pretty genius about this movie is there's so much of the like horror or violence that's off screen so it's like children Chilton showing Clarice a picture of what Lecter did to the last girl or whatever which I think is effective probably kept it in a R rating and not like a NC-17 or something um but I grew up in the torture porn era so I want to see everything show me the grossest shit you've got I can handle it so I'm gonna give it a two out of five because it definitely was scary um but i'll take a little more next time (laughs) (laughs) and then um for the film rating which i realized last uh recording is (laughs) not a scale of quality for me but a scale of how much i personally liked it (laughs) i'm gonna give it a nine out of ten because i mean this is one of the best movies ever made right like i think that's great like everyone kind of agrees yeah that's why it won so many awards it's why it's such a big part of pop culture it's why so many movies have just (laughs) taken inspiration from or totally ripped off scenes from this um but i really like it i think um it's like a bunch of talented people just firing on all the lenders. Yeah. And I think it has great music. It has great direction, direction that I've never really seen before in a movie. All of the um, actors are amazing. Um, the special effects are great. Um, I didn't realize this, but there aren't really any dummies. It's all people with like prosthetics and like goop on them. Um, and I really like the atmosphere. Like it's got a great atmosphere the entire time that never lets up. So nine out of 10 for me. Mm-hmm. Nice. I knew I was going to get kicked out of the What Scares Us Club by giving it uh, such a low rating. <laughs> it's not low, though. I like that you added that's the right. point five. Yeah. There. yeah. So bump it up a little bit. What did bit. you give it? Oh, a 7.5. 7. 7. 5. Yeah, no, that's not low. That's still a, that's a, that's a good score. Yes. Amanda gave the orphanage a four, so don't feel too bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If you look back at this, our stuff is all over the place. It is. And I, it's that's hard. It's awesome. I sometimes adjust my rankings on what I gave other things. I'm like, well, I gave Alien a 10, and I gave, only gave the, f- yeah. the Fog an 8. Or like, And then there's just, I just I just like everything, so I'm like, I'm going to yeah. give it like a 9 or a 10. And, <laughs> and uh, Matt, how did you feel about Silence of the Lambs? All right, so for me, uh, this is a this is a very scary movie. Um, it's definitely, I'm going to echo what you said. This is the, I think this is the scariest thing that we've watched because it's, more real um serial killers are scary psychopaths are scary um anthony hopkins is scary uh puzzle basements are scary uh with all of that in mind i'm i'm gonna say i'm gonna say four out of five because it it terrified me the first time i saw it and a lot of the stuff still works for me there are only a couple of horror or horror adjacent movies like this that still hold their power and the other one that i can think of is the shining and while i was watching this i i feel like i feel like it's in the same category for me it's just the atmosphere is still creepy uh the music the music really sells it for me in this mm-hmm. it's just every time i hear it i'm it, it just yeah it's just it this movie is scary this movie is very scary um that basement alone um, is enough to give it to make it a four for me. Uh, 
and the movie itself is it it's it's a no-brainer it's a 10 out of 10 for me it's a it is a perfect movie um i totally understand why it won all the awards i think the i think another thing that makes it so intense and scary to me is that it is holding up like the whole movie is it's holding this mirror up to weird misogyny and showing you like Mm -hmm. this is what she's seeing constantly and that as a as a man who will not experience that that's scary i can't imagine navigating a world like that Mm -hmm. um and that's not even the that's not even the main thing that is supposed to be scary in this movie but obviously we're showing it quite a bit um yeah, everything about this movie is great. There isn't a bad performance. There isn't really a bad scene in the movie. Uh, I just, I think it's perfect. 10 out of 10 for me. So do you think those bumbling cops were told to act like bumbling cops and they did a really good job at it? I think so. They have to be. I, I'm i I'm going with that. Yeah, it feels like all that stuff was deliberate. And I feel like I need to dive back into the documentary stuff just to see if there's anything about that. Because it, it, yeah it all everything in this is very well calculated and feels human it's the most human feeling movie that we've watched Mm -hmm. um which is again what makes it so scary uh yeah love this movie 10 out of 10. great movie would watch again um we did it guys well that said if you like what you heard here today and you want to let us know you can email us at what scares us at ael.org Thank you so much for joining us. This has been What Scares Us.